the student body to um, come up with a board, a student advisory board that will be working with the um, school board on issues from the student's perspective. And we're gonna take a moment today to have um, that board introduced uh, by Mr. Kurubis. So at the last board meeting we discussed this topic was March 14th. Um, the goal was to increase student voice committee was formed that meet, meets regularly and attends our board meetings. There's nine members, six students, two from each high school, one from administration, and two board members. Right now it is myself and board member Fosdick. The goal is to rotate board members. There will be an election process eventually for the students and we are working currently on building a structure and the goal is to have a student issue come before the board for the students to advocate and do a presentation uh, so uh, at this point I would like the students to uh, stand up and introduce themselves with your name and what high school you're from Thank you. I think the end goal is to get them more formally on the agenda and involved in uh, some of our discussions. Uh, but thanks for your attendance here tonight and the efforts you put forward. Yes, thank you very much. I know that you've been um, a subset of you or all of you have been at all of our board meetings recently. So um, we look forward to having more um, specific input from you. Um, going forward, so thank you. So our next topic is public comment. It is now time for public comment and 60 minutes is allowed. Each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that when those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups and as such ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. P public comment represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board members during the meeting but follow up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. Although this is not required it is helpful for the board to know whether the comments and concerns we hear are being raised by residents so we ask that you state if you live in the district and if you currently have children in our schools so with that we have five speakers today and the first one is Darcy Wexelbaum good evening Dr. Talley and IPSD 204 board members my name is Darcy Wexelbaum, and I'm the proud parent of a fifth grader in the district. October is Dyslexia Awareness Month. However, for my family and many others, it's not just October. It's November, December, and every month that follows. Excuse me. Dyslexia is defined as a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin, characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit in the phonological component of language. Dyslexia can affect the ability to speak, read, spell, write, do math, and occurs at all levels of intelligence. Dyslexia affects 20% of the population, which is one in five children. Our district of 27,400 students, that equates to 5,480 dyslexic learners. For dyslexic learners, our district uses the Spire Reading Program, which is research-based. In speaking to the September 18th, 2014 Congressional Committee on Science, Space, and Technology on the Science of Dyslexia, Dr. Sally Shaywitz, the leading expert in dyslexia and dyslexia intervention and head of the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity reported, 
Critically important is that schools must use evidence-based programs that have proven efficacy. Research based simply indicates that there are theoretical suggestions, but does not provide evidence that the program is indeed effective. Evidence based programs are akin to the level of evidence that the FDA requires before a medication can be approved for use. Many, many theoretical research based approaches when tested in the field prove to be ineffective. Our children's reading is far too important to be left to theoretical but unproven practices and methods. We must replace anecdotal and common but non-evidence-based practices with those that are proven, that is, they are evidence-based. So what is an evidence-based program for dyslexia? It's a structured literacy program that prepares students to decode words in a multisensory, explicit, and systematic manner. Examples include Orton Gillingham, Take Flight, and Wilson Reading System. Non-multisensory structured literacy programs like Fountas and Pinnell's Leveled Literacy Intervention and SPIRE are not appropriate and are in fact some of the least effective means to address the literacy challenges of a dyslexic student. Without intensive recommended evidence-based structured literacy interventions, our district's dyslexic learners' literacy skills will remain below grade level expectations will remain below their measured intellectual abilities and will increasingly interfere with their ability to access the curriculum and learn at the same standards set forth for all students in our district. I implore you on behalf of my dyslexic learner and countless others to replace SPIRE with an evidence-based- Ms. Donahue, the speaker's time has ended. Structured literacy program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Dili Baba Napa. Dilly. Hi, welcome. Hey, good evening, everyone. So, my name is Dilly Babunapa. I am residing in Eagle Point community. Hold that for one second. Will you lift up the mic? So that, there you go. Thank you so much. So, um, <coughs> I'm living in Eagle Point community, which is falls under still middle school area. So, last 25 years, there was this middle school bus uh, which is serving our community. So recently there was a decision, uh, we don't know what is the reason, or what made the changes. So, so it appeared that it will be discontinued from the next year. So if you look at the geographical structure of the community, so we have to cross on the Montgomery Road. So which is, I'm kind of very unhappy that it's last 24 years there was a decision actually. So there was a rules like, okay, this is a safety measure of uh, kids to care of, take care of that. But now that safety is gone and uh, all kids has to suffer, they, they have to cross the Montgomery Street and go to the middle school. So I just came here to express my concern on that. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Sunil Narayana. Good evening. Thank you once again for giving me an opportunity to present my views here. Um, I live in the Eagle Point neighborhood, I'm a neighbor of uh, Delhi, and my son studies in seventh grade at Still Middle School. Thank you. I've come to talk about the bus transportation issue. Every time there is a distraction anywhere in the world, in any but there is always a silver line. There is a positive side for every distraction. Well, this issue has created a lot of anxiety for the neighbors, for the community members. The good thing that happened is, we all got to know our neighbors better. We were able to put a name to a face. We were able to put an address to a name. All that happened. What I wanted to share here is a, di is a slightly different perspective to this particular issue because this, this issue is not just impacting the few families who have kids going to that school. I happened to speak to one of our neighbors who had moved in during the early winter of 2020, right through the pandemic. and. When we were talking about how do you find this place and all the other things, they said, had we known that buses are not going to be there, we wouldn't have picked this house. Now, that is a very strong statement for them to make in a casual conversation. So it is impacting a person's decision to whether they want to move into a neighborhood or not based on whether buses are available or not. This was also echoed by one of the real estate agents who is living the same street as mine because recently when people are coming for uh, looking at houses, when there is an open house and all that, 
out of the several questions they ask, this has become one place. Now, I would like to conclude with one other statement. A child doesn't cry because the child doesn't get a toy. The child cries when its toy is taken away. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Alicia Smith. Good evening. I am here to speak once again about equity in District 204. In District 204, it would seem that if you are privileged, you are supported. If you're from a marginalized community, you're on your own. If you live in a neighborhood where an Aurora Title School is located, you are denied busing. But if you're from a privileged area that has the same miles and similar traffic hazards, you are supported and you are granted busing. Gombert neighborhoods are denied busing to Fisher Middle School. Gom or I'm sorry, McCarty and Georgetown neighborhoods are denied busing to Wabonzi Valley High School. Yet Oakhurst, Stonebridge, Breckenridge, and Ashbury are all granted busing to their respective schools, even though they are also less than 1.5 miles from those schools and have similar traffic hazards or equal traffic hazards. In District 204, if you are privileged, you are supported. If you are from a marginalized community, you're on your own. In the last boundary change, the decision was made to send all three Aurora Title Schools to Fisher Middle School, which already has overwhelming needs. The district also has two school-wide title schools, which receive special, special funding because their low-income numbers are so high. The district's average amount of low-income students is 17% which is coincidentally the same percentage of low-income students that District 203 has. District 203 doesn't have a single school-wide title school, let alone having a school that has three times the district average of low-income like 204 does with Georgetown. Again, if you're privileged, in 204 you're supported. If you're from a marginalized community, you're on your own. Then in your new strategic plan, you are not gonna prioritize the accountability for looking at the data for marginalized students. So then how are we going to know that these policies that you are enacting are in fact equitable? 204 is supposed to be providing a quality education for all students and it's supposed to be fair and equitable. If other districts can do it, we can do it too. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Mahindra Basarati. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Mahindra Basreddy. I live in uh, Eagle Point. I live in uh, Eagle Point. Uh, my daughter, uh, 13 years old, goes to uh, Still Middle School. Um, I'm here to talk about the school bus issue again. Um, uh, you know, all the parents and friends said uh, safety and, uh, um, and the home values and everything. Um, here I would like to share some, uh, some of the uh, EHG environment, social governance ideas and how we can make our IPSD 204 as a finest and greatest institution in the state and country. You know, environment, right? Kids cannot walk, walk to the school in this winter, in Chicago winter. And we add so many cars to the, um, you know, if we stop the bus, the one bus equal to 40, 50 cars, so we'll add, to, you know, that many cars to the road, you know, traffic jam and the carbon footprint you know, so um, th that is not a good, you know, it, um, you know we, if, if we want to uh, be good to the environment, let's have a school bus for everyone. That is the environmental cause. Then I'll talk about the social. You know, kids will have better friends and better social life if, if, they, if, they, if they go by bus. Um, you know, because they, you know, they get to uh, talk and meet in the bus and uh, they will have a better social life. And parents also will have less stress to, you know, drop and pick up the kids. You know, um, working parents or non-working parents, you know, they can be more productive with other things. That is the social effect, um, you know, if we can have a uh, school bus. Then when it comes to governance, right, um, you know, some of the families may not have cars, uh, right, you know, um, you know, some of the parents said, you know, um, we, ne we need to increase the inclusiveness, diversity, so that uh, bus is available for everyone, you know. Um, you know, low income or upper income, everybody can go to school. Um, you know, that is the governance. So, um, 
and you know im- it improves the home values it attracts the more and more parents um you know um and uh, you know and when 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 we can attract the more parents and more kids will, it will it will increase uh, you know tax benefits to the school and t- tax benefits to the community um you know with all these um you know effects uh, um with the, with the esc i think you know if we can take this step and if we can arrange the bus for everyone i think we can be mo- you know unique and innovative and you know we can we can be the um, you know leading institution in the state and and the country i think uh, i hope we have all the resources to be able to provide the bus and so that we can take a leadership and change the uh, change some of the outdated rules uh, that is what i wanted to say thank you thank you We now move to our consent agenda and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report, Dr. Talley. Thank you, Ms. Donahue. <clears throat> Members of the Board of Education and the Indian Prairie community, I will start my comments by saying that the district has been informed that we are conditionally approved for a grant of $250,000 to support mental health. Because the approval is conditional, I will refrain from saying who the funder is of the grant. We have received $1.4 million in grants recently to support mental health for our students and their families. Last school year, our students spoke to us about the need for mental health support. Parents as well spoke to us. We feel that these grants will support our children. And at the next Board of Ed meeting, we do plan to share how these grants will be used. The mental health symposium that was scheduled for this past weekend has been rescheduled for March the 4th. That symposium will include a continental breakfast keynote session, multiple breakout sessions, and a community resource fair. Um, we be- child care will be provided for children ages 3 to 10, and people can sign up for the event on our district website. We continue to look for people to fill some vacancies. We have the need for nursing substitutes. If you know anyone who still has their nursing credential, a vital role in supporting our students when they're not feeling well. Yesterday was the annual Naperville Half Marathon Marathon 5K race. Team IPF was out in full force with runners running to raise money for the Indian Prairie Education Foundation. It was a great day for running or walking, depending upon your speed. Thanks to the cheer squads that were there uh, present cheering on the participants. I recall seeing Granger Middle School, White Eagle, Gombert, and Matillo. I'm sure there were many others, and I thank all of them for their participation. All of the board members participated in that event. Money raised support various activities, including the Young Hearts for Life program, which screens high school students for any heart conditions that have gone undetected. Additionally, our Fine Arts Festival that our larger community enjoys each year is financed through the fundraiser that we did. If you donated, if you ran, if you walked, I thank all of you. If you have not donated, you can always donate by going to the IPF website. Two of our high schools will be competing at the University of Illinois Marching Band Competition this upcoming Saturday. We want to wish both Niqua and Wabonzi good luck as they compete with 40 other high schools across the state. And finally, I will end my comments by talking briefly about the niche results. Indian Prairie was ranked 36 out of more than 10,500 school districts across the country. Indian Prairie's ranking improved by 20 points. In the state of Illinois, we are ranked number 11. Of those that are ranked above us, only one district is a unit district. The rest are high school districts. These overall rankings are due to the hard work of every staff member in the district. Uh, They were all focused on ensuring our student success and supporting each other. I'm proud of our staff for what was accomplished last year and very pleased with the overall results. I'll now turn it back to Ms. Donahue. Yeah, that was very, um, very impressive results for the year. And I think we were all thrilled to see that. And I think I echo the thoughts of thanking all the um, teachers, staff, students, families um, for helping that, um, that happen. So thank you. Our next um, item is the consent agenda. I need a motion for approving consent agenda items D through K. Make a motion to approve consent agenda items D through K as presented. Is there a second? I second. Any discussion? Okay, Michelle, will you please take the roll? Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Grover? 
Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Fosdick? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. And Ms. Donahue? Yes. The motion passes. Next, we move to our action items. I need a motion and a second to approve the resolution recognizing October 2022 as National Principals Month as presented. I move that the board approve the resolution recognizing October 2022 as National Principals Month. I second. Dr. Talley. The um, governor has issued this following proclamation, which you will approve, or I assume, tonight. Uh, and I will, uh, before I read it, though, I just want to say, as a former principal, I think it is one of the most important jobs that we have outside of those who work with the children on a daily basis in the classroom. Um, and so uh, I, I know that their work has gotten harder every year. And so I will now read the, what the proclamation reads. Whereas school principals play an integral role in the education and growth of children in elementary, middle, and secondary schools across the state of Illinois, and whereas school principals are responsible for promoting education and building relationships with teachers and parents to ensure that, that each child receives equitable educational opportunities and services to reach their potential, and whereas a primary responsibility of the state of Illinois is to preserve and improve resources for schools so that all students have access to quality education and foundation for a successful future. And whereas the Illinois Principal Association, which represents over 6,000 educational leaders statewide, believes that learning is a lifelong process and that the education of our children is the highest priority, and whereas school leaders face many obstacles in supporting and educating our young people and through their perseverance, devotion, and passionate leadership that Illinois continues to produce quality, career-ready students and whereas school principals have continued to face unprecedented challenges since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic and have worked tirelessly to provide the mental health, social, emotional support, and uninterrupted learning to the members of their schools since 2020. And whereas we must continue to encourage, support, and recognize our school principals who have a positive impact on Illinois students and the educational system in the land of Lincoln, therefore I, J.B. Pritzker, Governor of the State of Illinois, do hereby proclaim October 16th through the 22nd, 2022 as Principal Week and Friday, October 21, 2022 as Principal Day in Illinois. Thank you. Any discussion? Michelle, will you please call yeah. the roll? As a point of oh. order, mm -hmm. our uh, resolution is, is, is our own and is not a, the the governor's proclamation so ours is uh, very similarly worded hitting on some of the same points uh, but it uh, it is Indian Prairies and not the governor's okay. any other discussion okay Michelle will you please call the roll Miss Fostick yes Miss Grover yes. Mr. Karubas yes Mr. Rising yes Miss Deming aye Ms. Donahue? Yes. And Ms. Jane? Yes. The motion passes. Now we will have a presentation by Rodney Mack, William Gray, and Brian Grinstad regarding tech services update. Is this on? Uh, thank you, President Donahue, Dr. Talley, members of the board, uh, for this time tonight uh, to give our yearly update on the work we do throughout the year. Uh, we, uh, like last year, will come again in the spring, kind of like a more um, uh, pointed topic. This one is kind of the entire year, what we're doing uh, this year in technology services. I uh, wanted to start off first with a, a little bit of organizational change. Um, this year, we uh, brought back the assistant director role um, and recategorized two positions to uh, director roles this year. Big part of that was so that we had um, 
rewrite job descriptions for more of a future focus. Uh, a lot of the work always fell to the coordinators to do both forward thinking and coordinating their groups and the daily work. Uh, really needed to kind of separate that. So the director roles with um, Brian and BJ next to me really add a little bit of that forward planning, but also are able to add support and took a lot of work off that supervisor and um, coordinator roles this year. We are one of the larger departments at the district office, um, 46 members total. If you go uh, made up of four teams, our server team, data, network, and support team. Looking at the facts, um, seeing the items, um, we're looking at the numbers there, we're at about 45,000 devices in the district. Um, even with such a large number, it's still, for each of those individuals, it's about 1,700 devices they're responsible for. Um, controlling, taking care of, making sure that they're accessing information and working to their fullest extent every day. Um, it's, it's a chore, uh, but one that for some reason we're able to do with a smile every day. Um, The uh, daily network statistics uh, from last year to this year increased between 20 and 25 percent, depending on what you're looking at. Uh, last year at this time, we were averaging 2.5 million websites a day. Now it's 3.1 million websites. Again, that's staff and students and all of their devices. Same thing with the amount of emails that went up, about 25 percent. Um, another interesting figure over there in systems managed, uh, again, still 135 servers. Uh, we're up to about 215 terabytes of data. Um, to put that in perspective, 200 terabytes of data um, is the equivalent of about 50,000 movies um, or 28 blockbuster stores. I read that. It was a <laughs> nice one. Nice one. Um, uh, 50 million photos or 67 billion single-type single pieces of paper. When you think about that, that's you know, 200,000 documents in everybody's drive. That's not the way it is because it doesn't include pictures, but it still is astronomical numbers that, that we're – charged with protecting and holding secure and making sure that everybody can access them. Oh, I can't find my notes. Uh, a couple accomplishments that we'd like to uh, highlight this year. Again, a lot of these you might recognize as uh, um, bigger items that we passed through last year. Uh, we did refresh uh, about 550, 575 about devices. 500 smart boards were purchased last year. I believe at the last board meeting we approved the purchase of finishing out that elementary one. Um, with that refresh, we also redeployed a lot of the uh, uh, Promethean boards into other classes because um, they were not that old of units. So, again, being able to update the classrooms across the district at the elementary level. Um, we were able to replace switches in 28 buildings. We were hoping that said all 31 or 32 buildings. But, again, with uh, supply chain issues and stuff, this was the approval from E-Rate from a few years ago. It took a while to get all that equipment in and to plan it. Um, <coughs> do have a plan to finish that up this year. Uh, we did reduce the print services, um, or print devices, 225 units. That's across the district. Uh, that's part of the plan with the new copy print solution that we're bringing in place. Um, that also plugged in and standby all day, every day. Um, a big thing is we did get a perfect score on our phishing security test um, from CISA, or the Cypher Security Infrastructure Security Agency. That is through the um, Department of Homeland Security. Uh, perfect score is less than 15% of companies get a perfect score. Uh, us being an education institution is nice uh, to get that score. Um, we, we again celebrate that. That's not just people not replying to phishing. That's not what that phishing test is. It really is trying to push things through our email and our systems being able to catch a lot of it so it actually never gets to a human, if that makes sense. We still do, you know, have to rely a lot on humans not making the mistake if something does get through, but our systems were as able to stop all of their, their attempts, whether they be very sophisticated or, or simple ones with a lot of misspellings, they were able to catch them. Uh, we did have a, a large number of synergy improvements with year two. That was a goal of last year. Uh, we only had one real blip, and that was on their servers during parent-teacher sign-up. I know that's coming up again, so we're hoping it doesn't happen. No, I'm kidding, it won't. Um, part of that was they just weren't ready to handle the 30,000 parents. It wasn't a system here. It was their cloud-based solution. When we tell parents to log on at 10 a.m., <laughs> at 10 a.m. they logged on. I was in an administrative meeting, and about three teachers and principals looked over and go, I can't get in. 
uh, right away we realized it can't handle 30,000 requests at once. Everybody wants that first, uh, that first parent-teacher conference time. So uh, that was our only instance we had last year. We did do a health dive into Synergy uh, this year. We had the company come back um, working with our current data team. None of them were a part of the initial implementation as well, so they really never saw all the little pieces to where, it was, where it's at with where we're running now. Being able to take that look back, we had them here for two days. Uh, the team was like, you know, actually emailed and said this was a great thing for us to do because some things got answered that they weren't sure why things were set up the way they were, but they were afraid to make an adjustment. To have people from EduPoint here and be able to be able to look at all of that initial setup and say, why did you do it this way? You could have done it this way. This is what this means. Um, it really did. So we're really hoping that that you know, that pandemic rollout of a student information system, that that bad taste is kind of slowly going away and people are starting to understand it is actually a very good, robust system. Um, and another big thing is we closed over 20,000 service tickets last year. Um, of, of those, I do have to point this out, about 65% of them are, were Chromebook issues. So again, it seems like it's a lot, but when you, when you have 25,000 students, not that they all drop them but, or something happens, but that, that's a lot of devices in kids' hands, but uh, about 65% of those, again, are Chromebook issues um, that can always be fixed, you know, if we put our covers on them and stuff like that. Um, Mr. Grinstead last year did a bowling alley down the hall just to show that the covers work if you leave them on. It made a couple people jump out of their desk and look <laughs> over, but we proved that the covers worked. Um, <laughs> we, we don't want anyone else to try that if you're watching at home. <laughs> But we, you know, it was, yeah, they work, they, they do it, uh, but the students tend to take them off, so. Uh, again, I, I introduced this, this uh, focus area last year. It's, it's something I've always done to help um, years of doing this, looking at it from an education perspective on how we deal with technology. We look at four main areas, network and access or infrastructure, that stuff that's behind the walls, that's you know, not always the glorified stuff to look at. What is in the classroom instruction area? What do people need? What do teachers need to be able to educate? We look at operating systems. Again, that's software that we use, HR business, um, the copy solutions, Microsoft, anything that we use on a daily basis that we need to operate. And then, of course, safety, security, and data privacy. In all honesty, we look at that as an isolation, but it kind of encompasses parts of one, two, and three as well. So right now, we'll go over, the three of us will go over these three, uh, the four areas and what we plan on doing this year. Good evening, everyone. Is this on? Good evening, everyone. So currently on the network infrastructure side, we have three projects that we're working on. Uh, two of them were just approved tonight. Thank you for that. Uh, but the one, the phone system upgrade. So basically, our current phone system is about three versions behind. This phone system upgrade will upgrade the phone system's hardware as well as the phone system's software to get us to the latest version. When I say three versions behind, we're talking eight years behind so we're no longer under support so this was one of those immediate things that we kind of really needed to focus on uh, network switch upgrade like Rod said earlier we didn't get all the buildings done because of the supply chain delay so we have the three high schools remaining and the CEC Center <clears throat> increased server virtualization again was approved tonight uh, what we're looking to do is add or what we're doing is going to add more server processing and storage uh, to remove our remaining physical critical servers into our virtual environment once we do that we can create a fully operational failover site at Matea High School uh, so that's the goal uh, looking to uh, future planning, uh, we do have a wireless upgrade that we are looking at right now. Um, we are currently on a controller-based wireless access. Uh, we have about 1,600 wireless access points. One, we need to increase that, but two, we have to try to get away from a controllerless wireless system um, or controlled wire wireless system. The uh, new ones are cloud-based solutions. Uh, they have more security involved. There's more throughput. There's more visibility into the network when we go to that. We don't want to put more money when we know we need more access points in an older solution, so it really is kind of switching our wireless solution. Uh, that is probably something you'll see again in the spring as we really kind of dive into it. Um, leaning on E-rate for some of those funds, that's again one of those projects where we can, uh, you know, get 40% back from the, the federal government for E-rate on that. Um, so that will be coming this spring. 
Uh, we're looking at an increase in bandwidth, um, again, adding more uh, internet pipes. We currently have about 13 gigabits. Uh, we don't peak at any time now, but I, I always use the NCAA tournament as the uh, predictor as to when we're probably going to cap. I don't, if the NCAA tournament were tomorrow, <laughs> I'd be worried at 10 a.m. <laughs> we're, we're getting close. We don't do it yet, but as, as more and more video um, becomes critical in classroom instruction and teachers have kind of gotten away from watch the video and all 30 students watch some, it's watch it on your own, so you might have 20 Chromebooks all watching the same video, but at different times as they're working in groups. Uh, we need to be able to handle that type of bandwidth. Um, so we're looking at an upgrade. Again, that's an E-rated expense, but it is, there's a lot of planning that has to go involved into doing that. Um, and then uh, BJ is going to share with you here, we're also looking at an upgrade replacement schedule. One of the first things he did when he started here was to take an inventory of our system to kind of plan this next, uh, this next upgrade. So yeah, as, as the team sat down this summer, we looked at uh, what our critical hardware, the age of our critical hardware, and then what we did was compare it to the industry standard life cycle. And as you can see up there, we have fallen behind in many areas. You know, a lot of that was due to the COVID pa pandemic, uh, where we shifted resources and funding to support remote learning as opposed to our back end systems. After going through and creating this list, we decided to focus on these four highlighted areas. Uh, two of them we are addressing with money we found in this year's budget, which is the phone system upgrade and the server virtualization. Uh, good evening. Uh, operational systems and planning, this is kind of some of that back end stuff that uh, affects the front end systems too. Um, current plans and projects we have underway are Google shared department drives. What does that mean exactly? It's the all staff place where all teachers have access to the building. Every building has their department or school level shared space and it's moving that up into the cloud. It kind of goes hand in hand with BJ's virtualization comment and Rod's storage stuff. As we get more and more storage, it's getting more and more cost effective to move that stuff up to the cloud. We've got the space in Google, so if we move those files off of our local virtualized, virtualized environments and up to the cloud, it provides greater access for teachers. Our virtualization environment. Uh, print center change, we've had a long-standing relationship with 203 on a shared print center. Um, that's coming, reaching a natural point to reevaluate that as part of the copy or initiative we did last year and the printer consolidation. We we'll looked at bringing some of that work back in-house to our three high schools. They have got copy clerks in each of those buildings and seeing if they can take some of that load. And we did an evaluation on what's going to the print center and a lot of the standard jobs we can do in-house now with the new equipment at a significant cost savings. Um, some of the stuff, our specialty products and stuff, we'll still have to find uh, how we're going to do that in the future, whether it be a continuing relationship with 203 or another option. I would like to thank uh, District 203 for their longstanding partnership and their assistance on making this change. They've been uh, great to work with. Um, in terms of new software and data integrations, we're working on a couple of analytics things, Tableau being one of them, provide greater visual insights into data and how to slice and dice it for greater access. And another big project undergoing with the data team is um, high school class selection. We'll bring in a new product to work in hand in hand the synergy to hopefully make the uh, class selection process for the students more uh, seamless and more interactive. And then a huge one on there, which is just now in the infancy, is working with HR and business to help evaluate a new replacement for Lawson N4 been with us for about 14 years and we're probably a few years past the point of looking to do something but pandemic kind of set everything back some of those long-range plannings a little bit so looking to see and work hand in hand with them on evaluating a new system kind of bring that stuff up into the modern age and then part of that in the future approach too is it's listed in there both because that that is a the the, the tech hand in that other than keeping it running once it's running is in its first year and a half, two years, where tech is heavily involved in a new HR business solution. Um, part of that, making sure that we have all of the old historical data from the old system, 
what's brought into the new system as part of the training, all of the sinks, and then it, it kind of hits a culmination activity where business and HR are doing it on their own, and then we kind of peel back to where we're there for more support. But we keep it on there so that we don't, we always know it's there. We can't take on too much more. We have to kind of put that placeholder in our minds to say, we can't take on too much because in the next six months, we're going to have two or three data people who are probably knee deep on a daily basis in this very critical function of the district, uh, the HR and business solution. So working with Matt and his team on that, I know the solution is going out rather soon for the evaluation, but then our, our main work starts probably into the next year when we actually start to do all those data conversions. And then the other piece that we're looking at, there's a business continuity plan. I, I mentioned this last spring as well. Um, this, and again, it involves the entire leadership team and district and all the different functions. Um, as we started to go looking at the business continuity plan, there's, you know, how do we pay people if something were to happen? How, you know, how does, how does everything continue to function and keep running if, 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 let's say, Amazon Web Services goes out for a month and a half or something hacks and the whole internet fries? You know, I, I'm kidding, but I mean, we plan for what that looks like. Um, we're going to approach it as a two-prong. We wanted to have that whole goal by this year, but because the business and the HR system is switching this year, we'll have a large portion of the business continuity, probably how the schools can continue to function with backs up of synergy, how they can take attendance, grades, all of that. Parts of that whole plan that we're going to have to wait until we have a new HR business solution in place, but uh, we're still doing a lot of work and groundwork on getting all of the, uh, the ducks in a row so that we are able to better look at um, what does it mean if we are down for a week, how we continue to communicate and work with everybody. Uh, classroom and instructional area needs, some of our current projects right now um, are finish the elementary school projection upgrades that was approved in July or August, I believe. Equipment actually came in on time, which was shocking. Um, we are actually starting deliveries in tomorrow morning. This will get us to 100% of the core classrooms in elementary, the projectors and older smart boards. Some of those projectors are 14 years old and they're just past their prime. So they need to go back out and play with the other projectors out in the country. Um, so that should be done. Hopefully we'll finish that up by the uh, Thanksgiving. So uh, I know most of the staff I've seen in, out in the buildings have been very excited about that. I've got a couple of uh, cheers and claps from that. So it's always nice to see that. Uh, then this winter we'll be coming to the board with a middle school staff laptop uh, refresh. Our laptops at our middle schools are um, approaching their end of life at the end of this year. So it's about 600, 700 laptops along with the corresponding docking stations. All said and done when we're moving things in and out and re prepping the new stuff, taking out the old stuff, moving close to 2,000 pieces of equipment in and out of that. So it's easy to say, but it actually takes a lot more work to do. Um, then also at the same time, uh, we're in our three-year rotation at our high schools. So students will be checking in all their Chromebooks at the end of this year and picking up brand new units in the fall. It'll be about 9,000, 9,500 Chromebooks, depending on where we're at with spares. So that will be our major undertakings in terms of classroom instruction for this year. Uh, part of our future planning um, that we're looking at right now is again, since we just were finishing out the elementary refresh, uh, working with um, Brian Giovannini and the curriculum team, uh, people at the middles and high schools to actually look at their instructional spaces. Part of this is gonna be work that's done within the master facility plan. Uh, again, we didn't want to just assume it's smart boards. Technology keeps changing. What do they need? Uh, a lot of places now, it's, it's, it's multiple screens in a room, but they're not interactive. They don't have to be. There's, that's a lot less expensive. So really working with the team and, and following their lead as to what's needed. Uh, it was mentioned at a meeting earlier today, someone said, you know, our buildings weren't really built for the only instructional spaces were considered were the classrooms, the big squares on the map, you know, small instructional spaces weren't really a thing. So starting to figure out how those things work in with the uh, new master facility plan, but then also what's needed in those spaces as well. It's not just a smaller square with chairs. It has to have other things inside of it. So uh, really looking at what that future approach is and, and getting a refresh cycle in there again so we don't end up with 14-year-old projectors that, you know, this one we can see is even dimming to the <laughs> right a little. At least my eyes are telling me they are. Maybe it's my eyes. Open up um, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, uh, we're looking at the continued uh, printer consolidator, uh, printer and copier consolidation. Um, again, we reduced 225. Ms. Fosta asked about, um, you know, are we, we're never going to decrease the amount we probably print, but we're trying to do it on a more cost-effective approach. Um, just case in point, um, 
we're currently at about, with our numbers of 900 something, we have about 12 per elementary, 34 print and copy devices per middle, and about 138 per high school. Um, we should be at districts around here, four to five per elementary school, seven to 10 per middle school, and 20 to 40, depending on what kind of labs they might have in a high school. I mean, our, our number is closer to 300 we should be at a district our size. And it was hard getting 25 of them out of there. But again, putting the right machines in that can do more options for people, I think is the, the, it's the slow approach to get it done without ripping things away. But there's huge cost savings in doing that. Again, you know, we have some printers and things that are out there that cost, you know, 14, 15 cents a page when someone prints off. We're less than a penny on everything we do in our new agreement that everything comes to our, the newer equipment. The more we can remove those older units that we save on that, we also save on electricity. Those big printers that a lot of offices have, you know, they're, they're $120 a year just plugged in on standby, even if it only prints one sheet a day. Taking some more of these away. And then the last thing that we've got here for classroom instructional areas, we do have a Windows 11 operating system upgrade. Windows 11 has come out. Windows 10 was from 2015. If you're all wondering when that one was, we all remember Windows 95. It's about the only one we remember. <laughs> Everything else just kind of blends. <laughs> 2015 was when Windows 10 came out. Um, it's really not a change as much for uh, Brian and our teams. It's really, it's the who moved my cheese on my computer screen for everybody when we make their computer go to, uh, you know, to Windows 11. So. We have some planning to do for that to get that ready to roll out and, and see how it works in our, our solution. <coughs> Safety and security projects we got going on right now. Uh, Two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication, which is a security uh, best practice currently. Uh, for us to fully implement uh, this year for our cyber, insur uh, cyber security insurance. Um, we also are doing an internal and an external penetration testing right now. Hope to have those wrapped up in the next couple weeks. We'll get the reports back and then we can take a look at our, if any, vulnerabilities. Uh, another thing that we did this summer was uh, acquire a new modern-based backup solution. And uh, this will allow us to do offline and off-site backups. Typically, today's hackers or attackers to find your backup data first encrypt it, and then hold your production data ransom at that point. Uh, by moving to this new solution, we're able to replicate our data to two uh, off-site locations, uh, and the servers actually turn on during replication and then will turn off after the data is copied so that nobody can have access to it. We're also sending the backups out into the cloud, and out there it's immutable, which means we can't delete it. We internally, our staff can't delete it. We can't make changes to it. It's all done by a policy that we created ahead of time. Uh, and then part of our future work there is looking at uh, uh, what's called a NAC or network access control. Uh, it's a security measure. Um, right now, again, as everyone knows, you can you see a port on the wall and plug into it. We have a lot of teachers and, and visitors from outside of the district sometimes who come in and teach classes. Um, a, a NAC, what it does is it'll actually read anything that comes from outside the district or that's not district owned, and it kind of flags it and says, you only get this access, you can't get to our servers. You can't, you know, it, it's another layer. Uh, it, it allows the network itself to be able to stop people from getting on it. Right now, if anyone were to go around, you know, they could plug in to one of our things and not use it maliciously, but a lot of times that, that's one place we don't want people on our network if they can't get on the Wi-Fi. So adding a network access control really is that will stop the, uh, you know, someone being able to plug into a, a hard line sense and get anywhere else in the network. We're also looking at enhanced uh, internal firewall. Um, what that means is, you know, if we all think anything out of the district or in, an enhanced internal firewall in case anything ever does get in, it changes the schematics of everything so that machines can't get to things internal. So if we have our servers and we put them in a certain area and say no computers except for these two can get to this. It's another, it's like an internal firewall that just stops. Not that people in the district are the hackers and stuff, but I mean, a lot of people that do start sniffing and try things and sometimes don't realize, 
It also does just in case someone gets past CrowdStrike or something and their own computer gets hit and then they bring it into the network that it stops it because they don't normally have access to those servers as well. Um, so just another uh, security protocol we're looking at doing. And then again, as, as BJ talked about, that disaster recovery, those um, solution that he's looking at to do with Matia, um, adding our servers and making them more virtual with the online, offsite, or the offline and offsite backups, um, a disaster recovery plan. Um, we have one written out right now. It's never been tested. So part of our solution once we get these new systems in place is we are going to be testing things twice a year. You know, we'll let everybody know when we're doing it, but turning the power off and seeing if everything does pick up at Matia. Uh, having Matia run as the main and then, you know, killing the internet connection there. Does, does the CEC pick up so that no one's the wiser? Uh, one, so that we can continue to operate, but two, so that we know that we do have that in case anything goes down. We have only had a few outages here power-wise, but that does take a lot of other systems down. Once we have that disaster recovery, it, it allows us to uh, spin things up real quick or seamless if, if, uh, if we set it up correct. That's pretty much everything, well, I mean, outside of the little, hundreds of little things we've got going on, but um, uh, one thing that we're adding this year as we do these presentations uh, is the tying this into the strategic plan. I don't believe this was on the one that I shared out earlier with you, but uh, a lot of the work we have doing uh, hits on priority two, objective two, and priority four, objective one and two this year. Um, just as we start to look at that strategic plan as being our guiding document for all the work that we're doing. Any questions? None? Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Fosdick, do you have questions? I just want to clarify the two-factor authentication is for just staff right now or will it be for all users? It will be for all staff users, not all students. Okay. It's required by our cyber uh, security insurance that all staff uh, have that two-factor authentication, and we're going to put it on the single sign-on, basically. Is there a plan to move that forward to students at some point? Not yet. There could be, though. Uh, some di again, this is where we're going to let someone else go first. Um, <laughs> luckily, a two-factor is, again, it, it can be, you know, even a password and then a certain three, the you know three pictures or something in our in our system. We're going to get past the staff first, but okay. uh, it's real hard to say. You know, we think of two factor as something that we have, and it being a device. Um, we do have for the younger kids. I think grade three and up is used. Grade three and K down. One and down. K, K, one. Oh, K and one are using QR code logins on their Chromebook, so they don't even have to type passwords. That can be something that everyone has. Maybe we can get a QR code for every student, and then a password <coughs> for those at the high school or middle school level as well. But it, it's, it would be a goal, one, to just more or less teach students the need to keep their data secure, you know, as a learning thing, but probably not in this year. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jane. Thank you, everyone, for the comprehensive review. Once again, um, it helps us reflect and appreciate all the things that we take for granted. Um, I really don't have any questions. I just want to express my um, interest and um, in our future approach in, uh, with regard to classroom and instructional area needs in terms of how we might use instructional spaces. I just found that to be um, exciting and I look forward to hearing uh, what comes out of that analysis and assessment. Thank you. Ms. Dumming. Thank you so much. Um, I really found uh, slides seven, eight, and nine. Um, you know, there's so many, so many different areas in our district where, that we've talked about before. Um, that due to some of our financial um, structure, we're, we're, we're having to do more with less. And this really hit home, especially as I looked at the, um, you know, some of our equipment, current age versus life cycle. So thank you for, for doing what you have done so much in, in prioritization. And it's really good to see and, and hear that, um, you know, some of the, the equipment that 
needs to be taken care of that we can that can be taken care of um, it probably points to, to oh I'm sorry <laughs> Apologize. I thought it was on too. It's because I talk so I can hear you. I talk so well. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, gosh, what's I saying? <laughs> um, it, but it points to the fact that that you you know certainly prioritized um, taking care of equipment as we needed to. One of the things that I was um, the create and upgrade replacement schedule. Um, so that. Is that in addition to some of the age of equipment versus industry standard or? It's, it's setting probably the next stage of that. So we don't end up in this again, really looking at it and saying, you know, network firewalls are at three years and UPSs are, sorry, the uninterrupted power supplies are at four years now. They're doing it, setting up so that we're looking at, uh, you know, Brian and his group with the refresh of Chromebooks and desktops and all that. We've always been able, you know, they, they've created that years ago and he's been great about this area has always kind of been, when it's needed, the, it's, it's the not glorified stuff that's behind the walls a lot. So adding those things in so that we know in two years, three years, what's coming down so that we can help Matt budgetarily and say, we have these expenses that's going to come, whether they're capital or come out of our budget, however we figure, we're just not surprised and we're not behind. I think that's the, the big piece. So um, right now we were able to take care of the real critical, but again, you can see in a few of those, in a year or two, we would have another big, and these are not inexpensive things. I, I don't, I mean, you know, you can go, oh, UPS for each building, but I mean, you know, we've, when we add something, we're adding 150 UPSs for the buildings, and it, it's not like the kind you buy for 19 bucks at Costco when it's on sale. I mean, these are, you know, $50,000 <laughs> devices. They're, so it, it, it adds up. So really trying to create this into a long-term, here's where you're going to evaluate, here's where you're going to purchase, so that we can kind of say it doesn't all come to fruition, and we have seven things we've got to fix at one time. That's the plan. Great. Thank you so much for that explanation. Thank you. Very um, um, well, well uh, thought out and uh, presented report. So thank you very much. Mr. Rising. Could you go to slide six? So first of all, areas one, two, and three I'm more than impressed with where you guys are at. And, and clearly you have a handle on all those areas. Um, and I'm feeling really good where we're at. Um, if you could go to slide 12. Um, first of all, good luck with staff with multi-factor authentication. Um, hopefully the pilot is to going wonderfully. <laughs> good. good. <laughs> Although I just tried to sign on to the single sign-on and it gave me the six questions. I hope you're not doing the six questions. Um, no, we were getting away from the six questions. Uh, okay. The six questions have been, have had lots of opportunities over the years that we hope to move away from. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then I hope we do go down the path with students with 2FA or MFA. Um, I, I think it's extremely important. Um, especially with the students single sign on and everything else um, I'm encouraged to hear that we're doing the QR codes for the littles um, but uh, I hope we look at with the students as well and I think that'll probably go a lot better let's be honest than with the staff um, I think the students are are used to that that multi-factor or, or two-factor authentication piece um, so I, I'm just gonna ask questions as it goes back to your last presentation that you gave us Rod in May on security um, we focused on the um, Falcon the crowd strike and I heard you mention that during your presentation from a security standpoint is that in place now are you guys running that are you guys getting reports back how's how's the security part looking on that so basically when we did the fishing uh, test through uh, CISA. This was in the event of this email getting through and you were able to receive the email that got past our spam filter, double click on it and see the results. So basically we were shooting off, clicking on live viruses, controlled viruses, but live viruses. CrowdStrike found every one of them. Okay. 
we've been doing the internal and the external penetration testing right now, and CrowdStrike has been alerting us of what our vendors are doing and stopping our servers from production, basically. So, so far, CrowdStrike has been a huge success. We do get reports on a daily basis whenever there's a, 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 a vulnerability or anything like that. So, um, but uh, all of our vendors we've talked to that we're doing internal pen test, external pen test, the phishing test, they all say CrowdStrike's the best. It is fully implemented uh, throughout the district now. Yeah, it's on all servers, all workstations, PC-wise, so they've had about 15 to 20 hands-on keyboard remediations they've done for us, where they've isolated a potential attack. Probably about half of those were pro false positives, but it's real time and it's been in place and it's been good. The other thing that before BJ got here last year, we had CISA pro start scanning all of our external websites and all those have also gotten 100% success with no vulnerabilities. So we've continued to improve our security posture and we'll continue with these initiatives. Okay. Yeah, because that's, that's my biggest fear because I, I, I keep up with on the tech side, the ed tech side, and, and I just saw last month Los Angeles Unified got shut down. They just, they just like the free publicity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so, I mean, that's always my fear for our district is we get shut down, our data gets held hostage, um, but it sounds like we've got a lot of layers in there in place, plus we're monitoring things through the CrowdStrike. Um, I guess my only other question is, um, I'm sure we already have a disaster recovery plan in place, I know in May you were talking about, you know, that part of this future approach is kind of a refreshing of that disaster plan. Is that something you're looking at starting like in the spring or summer? Or? Once the server virtualization stuff is up, because part of that having that secondary site at Matia is one of the major parts of the disaster recovery. So that the thing you approved this evening for the, the expansion is that first step in us being able to then start to test and write out the directions for what that disaster recovery is. Um, another point too where if people are worried about safety security please remember too we're not going to talk about everything in public that yeah. we do. <laughs> no I, I wouldn't ask I wouldn't ask specific questions. Here's our password if you want to see it. No um, <laughs> you know there are quite a few more th layers here that we don't really share but uh, it is just you know these are these are some of the things that you'll see this year that come for you know expenses that we need to spend in some of these places but uh, to go back to CrowdStrike has been a I think it's been a, a very Good monitoring tool. Very good purchase for, yeah, again, and I, I think I said in May too, a big part of that was that 24-7 monitoring. We don't, you know, what happens at 6 p.m. when everybody's left and something, get, we get the email, someone's on it, They and I would say their response time is less than two minutes right now from integrate. Well, well under 15. I mean, it's, it's amazing how you can see when the thing hit the machine and how quick they're on it going, we saw this, we isolated it, we're doing, I mean, their email back is like, and I just read them just for enjoyment. I don't, they, I don't reply, um, but it's like, wow, it's really quick. It's, it's a nice solution to have. <laughs> Thanks. Mr. Kurubis. I'm going to take a little different tact. So when you start the presentation on slide one, the district adopts uh, a policy of showing the policies that are going to be relevant to the discussion. Uh, in this discussion, 6235, access to electronic networks. That deals with kind of the acceptable use of the networks. Um, in that policy, it references that the use of the, dis of the electronic networks shall be consistent with the curriculum and comply with the instructional material that's been adopted by the board. And the board is charged with approving the curriculum and approving the instructional material. What I've learned over the years is sometimes the law doesn't keep up with all the technological advances. And so we approve a book that goes on a shelf and at the same time we provide computers and Wi-Fi and internet access uh, that allows a lot more access to curriculum and instructional material above and beyond the hard materials that are provided in our classrooms and libraries. And then it, the policy goes on to talk about internet safety. 
where we will provide filtering devices to filter out certain material. And then the policy goes on to talk about how we will monitor um, the network to make sure that those things don't appear in a classroom. So going to slide four, what drew my attention is daily, <laughs> approximately three million websites are visited. In daily, approximately 136 websites are blocked. Uh, so on a daily basis, our system is blocking four to five percent of the websites that are trying to be accessed. Um, I find that very impressive. Comment? You know, and I th honestly, I think some of that can be um, when we're talking about the sites blocked. A lot of that is not people trying to access sites. A lot of that is because we block ad content and stuff on websites. So a lot of those, it, it's probably a. That's what our report tells us is blocked. But I also know if I look at it, a lot of it is the ads that are on the sideline of a news and everything else. It's not. I wouldn't say we have an intent of people trying to get where they're not supposed to, because I think students know these are monitored. I think everyone knows where their access is set to leave. I would say out of that 136,000, very, very few actually see the screen that says you're being blocked from this site. Does that make, I mean, I wish I could figure out how many see that screen compared to how many are ads, but I don't, whatever web filter I've ever used, it's, it's always that. You get that information knowing that ads are a large part of that. Yeah, but that's part of our charge as well, to make yeah. sure we're not subjecting right. our students to commercials that are. Yep, so yes, you're right. And again, you're right, those ads, but I mean, any, any pop-up blockers, everything that comes across. But that is, it's again, it's, I mean, I wish I could say how many I would think, but I would honestly say the attempt to get to sites they're not supposed to is probably less than 5,000 on a daily basis, uh, right. where I think kids are trying to type to a site that they shouldn't get to. And most of those is Discord, <laughs> or, <laughs> I would be honest. It's and I mean, part of our charge. Or TikTok, charge, yeah. <laughs> that is true. Some of that is why the material at one point may have been perfectly valid. It's been a hijacked site that serves malicious software, sure. so now it's blocked. You know, or you're searching from an obscure term and click on some website you don't know and it's miscategorized or something. So there's also protects people from themselves from making inadvertent mistakes also. And part of our charge is teaching the appropriate behavior so that they don't engage in the conduct that would put them at risk in multiple levels here. So kudos but to Correct. You. I mean, in that case, we don't, we, I don't want to, we don't block everything that, that a parent might call and say, please block this site for all students. We're like, and again, that's the old librarian of me saying, no, we used to teach everybody where to go before the filters were as sophisticated as they are that there is how, how to search appropriately, how not to click on links that, you know, just because it's the number one Google search doesn't mean it's the one you click on. Um, but yeah, part of that is, and again, um, Brian Giovannini and his team are real key to on, let's teach the best practice. Let's don't always put the block up and add, you know, we get requests, please block this aspect of YouTube. Well, we can't, some teachers might use it, you know, it, it, it is, we would rather teach the best way and I think that's part of the library directors I think they they hold that true as well and I you know slowly but surely it used to be only their role now it's every teacher's role and I think that they've all you know gravitated to understanding that it's not just hey I go search find something and click it and that we all we all do that how to judge the data and the information that's out there thank you Ms. Grover I have a question regarding Google. Um, the Google shared Department Drive, so do, do all our teachers use the same platform? Or do they all use Google and put their stuff on Google Classroom, or do they have different platforms that they use? Most use Google for Google Classroom purposes, yes. We don't use a different uh, learning management system or an LMS. You know, we use Google Classroom. Uh, a lot of users still use Microsoft Office. We still have access to that as well, but. Um, in the case, I even said this today at Cabinet, you know, 98% of our users are in Google. 2% of us work here. <laughs> we, <laughs> we like Microsoft. Um, but, you know, it's where they're using Google is to share with students. It has become the, the natural place to also share with other teachers. So moving those drives, whether it's a Word doc or not, you know you can open a Word doc in Google, putting them out in those shared drives. One, it puts it in a cloud where we're still backed up and everything. Um, 
it makes it more accessible without having to use VPN. You know, we had to give everybody VPN access during um, COVID. We, we don't want that out there on every laptop to be able to remote in to get to a file they need on a server if we can put it in, in the cloud. Um, so again, think of it more of a storage, not of uh, I'm going to open it in Google. They can still pull it down and open it in Word if they use it. But I, I wouldn't say a percentage, but I would say, you know, it's got to be 95% or higher are probably using Google with their students. So that's probably where they have most of their documents. And most of the students work collaborate on projects, like especially in English, where one student will write something and another student will edit it. And they're working on, like you said, the shared drive. Um, and that's they also do Google Meet sometimes, so that's, I just want to confirm, you know, that's safe for the kids, it's safe for them to do that. Because um, I know in the past, not in our district, but there were issues with Zoom before. Um, right. So. Yeah, and, and again, Google, um, the documents individually that students might share is like an individual to an individual share. These shared drives are really where we're taking the collection of all of the social studies teachers' works that they collaborate and put it into a drive that no one person owns but the district does so it's right now if I share something with you and I leave that document's gone does that make sense this puts it and protects all of those documents um, uh, more for the departments and the teachers themselves if they share those with students it's different but when students are sharing they're sharing individual documents it's, that's not gonna be part of drive that's just them giving another student access to their file and then um, you were talking about printers and we we're making the printers better so to speak and having doing that we can lessen the number of printers um, how are our 3d printers do we have them in all the high schools or do we have a few or um, I don't have the exact numbers at me but yes every high school has 3d printers um, every middle school has 3d printers and every elementary has 3d printers okay. um, some of the schools have been a little um, creative and some grant funding so the numbers may be off depending on how they've been purchased but the district did see, uh, place 3D printers and every level has 3D printers. Thank you. So uh, when I look at the slide four, it is um, actually such an important um, part of our ne our district to make sure that this is up and running. And I mean, it's we can't. It would be very hard to function with this um, not working. So it's a very critical piece um, for us and concerning when. We looked at that slide, Ms. Dumming pointed out the age of some of the equipment and the need to make sure that it gets upgraded. And so I'm, I'm very happy that you're um, focused on looking at that, what the average life cycle is. And, you know, and it just points out you know, the need to continually look at these critical resources for our network and our infrastructure for our students and staff because um, I also, um, Mr. Rising brought up the disaster recovery, but I think it would be helpful if you just explain a little bit what's the difference between business continuity plans and disaster recovery, because you had both in your um, longer vision type of view. Yeah, uh, business continuity is how is really, how does the entire organization continue to work? Um, business continuity, something goes out, how do we take attendance the next day? If paydays in three days, how are we paying people if our systems are offline? having a solution and a um, kind of a plan in place to work without the technology, disaster recovery is getting it all back up and online. Um, disaster recovery, again, we have 135 different systems we use. What are the 10 critical disaster recovery is get those up first. Part of that leads into business continuity. We know these 10 are coming first so that people can get up and run. Um, disaster recovery, more happens um, if there is a disaster, say this, natural catastrophe, fire or something, this building burns down, how do we make sure everything's up and running, disaster over there? Recovery would be, uh, we do get hit with a ransom on our local servers and everything's up, how do we get back to the backups and get them installed? That's more of a process. Um, the business continuity is kind of the plan you have to put in place to make sure that everything is gonna work. And it's, the business continuity is not all tech. I would say the disaster recovery is all tech business continuity is who's doing what at which stage again you know do we have a file with everybody's pay so that if something happens we know what it is so we can manually sorry Matt write the checks <laughs> you know I, I mean there literally there's there's that type of a process is in a business continuity how do we continue you know what happens how do we make sure that the food service is running do we have a 
hard line or exported thing of how much food does go from each building out every day if the computers are gone. Does, is, are they going to go, I don't remember how many went last time. You know, it's that type of stuff. It's almost like taking things online so that we can run without electricity or tech in those sense. It's, it's, it's kind of, it, it involves us reaching out to a lot of people to put the dots in a row to say, we'd be fine if, and I always use Amazon as the example, because if Amazon web services shut down, you, you know, the stock market, everything would crash. What would we be doing to continue to work? Mm -hmm. Continuity is kind of think about it as what happens when the systems aren't available. So the disaster recovery is to restore the systems, but what happens if the systems aren't here? How do you continue without systems? So in, um, your printer discussion too was interesting. So was it, did I catch this correctly? Like here it says 950 print and copy devices and you were saying that it should be around 300 and your experience of looking. <laughs> yeah. That's a I lot. I don't have that written anywhere, but I mean, uh, having, I've done this in two other districts, it, it, it is, it's a change. Um, so for historical perspective, when we started this process in 2008, we had 3,200 print devices. Oh. Yeah, it's, we're getting down there. Wow. <laughs> but again, it is all about efficiency. And, and again, I don't think the numbers of print changes, it's just someone might go and they might have to walk a few extra steps. You know, it's never, we try to do it where it's never more than 100 steps, but strategically placing them in our buildings, especially when. No, you well, start walking 100 steps from your <laughs> office, aren't you? Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it is, it's, again, it's, there's a lot of savings to be had. A lot of it is, it's the un, you know, we're, we're, we're going to see the savings right away because electricity costs are going up, but dropping 225 of those probably saved a lot. The rate went up, so we don't see it. That's all yeah, kinds of things, yeah, right? unique. And the cost of every unit, you know, costs different. The ones that we put in, we pay point zero zero four. We, you know, I probably shouldn't say that out in public, but well, it's a good thing. But, um, <laughs> but every, you know, none of our other fleet that was there that we're still paying for is even less than a penny. So when people are still sending to these older units, it's more per click. And if you print ten thousand on that compared to ten thousand on the other one, we would have saved money for someone to maybe walk twenty extra steps. It's also just cost avoidance too because printers have a life cycle just like the age of the infrastructure. So as those start to get up in age, do we replace them all or do we be more strategic, get you know a better, fewer better devices or keep going everything with fewer better devices, even save even more, you know, a better device today uses less energy than a lower device did 10 years ago. It's easier to set a refresh schedule for 300 devices on a yearly than it is the 950 we have now. Yeah, I think it's very helpful to have that further like enlightenment about printers because I think people are the convenience factor. It's like right next door, I can go. But it's also like you heard earlier in the discussion when you have something and then you try and take it away, it's not a happy situation usually. So, right. but, but thank you. Things. And two of these is going to be easier than a room. So. <laughs> <laughs> And so it sounds like one of the biggest things um, our students can do too is keep the cover on their devices. So, yes, yeah, so the three students who were here are gone, but only one of, only one of them, two of them had their cover, one did not. <laughs> I was going to make the comment. I thought, well, Thank you. I'm not going to throw any of them under the yeah, bus, but it is, it's probably yeah. the effort yeah. we see out there. Yeah. There's there's really three core things: leave the cover on, don't carry it by the lid, and don't use the inside as a trapper keeper to store your phone and pens. A lot of kids throw their stuff in and close the thing to go to the next class and uh -huh. they get back in the screen shatter because whatever uh, they put in there broke the screen. If those three things happen, that would account for 95% of all the damage. Hmm. Maybe we need to have some kind of uh, ad campaign or marketing campaign for this. So, but yeah, so thank you. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Our next presentation is from Matt Shipley and John Robinson regarding the facilities update. Yeah, that was all right. 
right Calling the tech people, the microphone should work, right? Um, good evening, members of the Board of Education. Uh, tonight, we are here to discuss our annual facilities update. Uh, the last time we were um, in front of the board discussing facilities was in, at our December 2021 board meeting, and a lot has changed since then. We have, uh, I think, some several exciting updates for you tonight. Um, the first of those includes who's with me. So I have our new director of building operations, John Robinson, uh, here tonight. John started with the district uh, in July and has really hit the ground running. Um, so um, we're, we're happy to, to have him, excited to happen. And we, we left him a lot of work and, and a lot of plans. And so far, he's been up to, up to the task. Um, I also have with me Maria Blood tonight. Um, Maria is with Upland Design. Um, she's going to share a little bit of information later in the presentation about one of the projects we have planned for the summer of 2023 which we're uh, really excited about, and that's our elementary playground um, replacement project. Um, there's one individual who's not here with me tonight, um, but I would like to recognize um, before we go too much further, and that's our uh, former Director of Building Operations, Todd DePaul. Uh, as the board knows, Todd retired in June with 38 years of service to the district, the last 14 as the Director of Building Operations. Uh, and I, I will say a lot of the successes that we discussed tonight would not have been possible without Todd. Um, so I do want to recognize um, all the hard work and dedication he had to the district. I think, um, at least in my experience, there were f there's few people who were as dedicated to the district as, as Todd was. So um, he would not let me say anything nice to him before he left. Um, he wanted no recognition whatsoever. But I think I found a loophole by recognizing him after he left uh, tonight. So I, I wanted to do that. And, and again, um, I think he still watches these, so um, although he may have, he may have he he may have turned it off when he, when he heard me say some kind things to him, but I but I did want to recognize Todd before we went any further. Um, so with that, we have we have three main topics for tonight. These could probably all be their own presentation, but uh, we will uh, review our summer 2022 projects, the work that um, has just been spring, summer, and early fall. Um, then we're going to talk about our, our plan for our master facility assessment and, and planning process. Again, we discussed this um, briefly in, in, um, at the December 2021 meetings, and it's been part of our strategic plan. But uh, John and I want to share what our, what our vision is for that as we start that work here uh, in the next month or so. And then um, finally, we'll, we'll talk about what we have planned for the summer of 2023 projects. Again, we have a lot of work um, we are hoping to get done over the next 12 months. So, thanks for having me. Um, one, uh, one thing you'll notice in our presentation is we're not going to talk much about um, the operation sides of what we do, whether it's cleaning or maintaining or the grounds or HVAC. We'll, we'll get that to a, another point uh, when I get a better handle on it. Um, but we're going to talk about more infrastructure uh, stuff. So. Like, like Matt said, I started July 1. It's always a tough job to start anything like this on July 1. BJ and I have had this discussion because you're in the middle of something that you didn't start. You, you got to finish it. And so it went well. Um, we did $10.5 million worth of work. We did a lot of work in a, a lot of buildings. And I'll, I'll, I'll get in more detail in the next slides. But it, everything came in on, on budget. Um, I'd say this, the biggest challenge was uh, labor supply, strikes, um, but we were able to get through it all. So the biggest project that we worked on this summer is the last phase of the air conditioning of the elementary school. So that started in the summer, and it's going to end next summer um, with all 19 elementary schools uh, just having the, the uh, libraries or the LMCs remaining, and uh, we're working on them as we speak. We're also installing doors in these schools that separate the LMC from the unair conditioned hallways. And that's, that, that'll be started in Thanksgiving of this year. <coughs> we also did a lot of masonry, tuck pointing, and roofing projects at many of our schools. And here are just some pictures that you can see. Um, they are all completed and went well. We did some parking lots at the uh, couple of three different schools, actually four. Um, the, the buildings are anywhere from 20 to 25 years old in most cases, and that's just about the sweet point where you need to start redoing the lots. So um, we're getting those done uh, a lot in the next few years. 
Uh, the Family and Consumer Sciences Labs over at Wabansi and at Yuthia Valley where we've done, you can see the pictures, they look real nice. They're, they're uh, much more commercialized versus institutionalized. They, uh, they, they provide more collaborative uh, learning and good workstations for the staff and the teachers to uh, interact with the, ch with the uh, students. Uh, on the athletic side, we did uh, two tennis courts, one at Niqua um, and one at Ntia. We resurfaced the track at Wabansi. We did some uh, long jump and triple jump pits in inside the fence. Um, some storage buildings at Matia and a couple more at Wabansi Valley for the football program and the baseball program. So uh, a lot of good upgrades and it seems like the schools are pretty happy with those. So next, we, uh, as mentioned, we want to walk through uh, what we're envisioning for our master facility plan um, that we hope to begin work on this month. Uh, we expect this to be a district-wide facility plan that's designed to assess conditions of all our district facilities and then develop a capital plan for improving all those facilities over the next 10 years. Um, our last facility uh, assessment was done in 2014. Uh, th these Plans tend to have a useful life of seven to ten years, so we're right at the, the spot where we need to, um, where that facility assessment is kind of becoming due, due for a refresh. Um, but I will say we're looking to really uh, make this a lot um, larger of a process and a lot more inclusive than, than prior facility assessments have been. And we'll, um, the first part of that is really being collaborative, um, involving not just our building team, but um, our building operations teams with involving building and district administration, Just and again, not just having a focus on the, the core infrastructure of the building, but um, several different areas of the building or, or all areas of the building and how they impact our students and student learning. Um, this is also a good time for it um, just because it, it really is a natural extension of the district strategic plan, which was recently adopted, um, and as well as um, an extension of the enrollment and boundary work we did last, um, uh, last fall and winter as well. So um, in our minds at, at this point, we, we have a good handle on what our enrollment um, will be over the next five to seven years, what our capacities are in our buildings. Um, we have a good handle of what the strategic objectives are of the district and, and what areas our district is going to work, work to, to achieve on the, the curriculum, the learning, the learning side, the programming side. So this is really the, next, the final piece of that puzzle is to, to address how our facilities can support that strategic plan. So just want to work through what that timeline will look like again over over really the next 12 months. So um, at, within the next couple weeks, we'll be releasing a request for proposal, which will outline the work that we um, want to have done. Um, it'll inc include a lot of the, the vision that we're discussing tonight. Um, and we'll be asking for assistance from um, architects um, or other other um, contractors or other people in the building trades to help with this process. Um, we expect we'll have at least one architecture firm that we'll, that we'll use as part of this process, but it's possible that just given the scope, we end up using multiple vendors as part of this process. Um, we will evaluate those, those service providers and, and make sure that their vision and, and their programming and their experience is consistent with what our vision is. And then we, we expect to recommend a, um, a, at least one vendor, but again, possibly multiple vendors to work with the district uh, at the December Board of Education meeting. Um, Starting in, in January and really going through the school year will be sort of the first phase, and that's really an assessment phase. So that's um, boots on the ground um, of all 35 buildings, all four, 4 million square feet um, of John and his team, um, district administration, wor and, and others working directly with school leadership, our instructional learning teams, our, our principals, our, our teachers, and um, even some of our students to really um, understand the buildings, uh, assess the, the overall condition of the buildings, um, again, j not just the infrastructure, but get a feel from, from our administrators how the building's working for them and what, what are the areas that they see on a daily basis that, that maybe we won't see or, or architects won't see, um, but, but they see and they experience as, as they're in that building on a daily basis. Um, as, we, as we compile the results of that assessment, then we start moving into the second phase, which is really that preparation of that master plan. Um, so that's, that's the point where we prioritize the work, where we... Uh, again, work with our administration to say, here's what we found, what, what makes sense from a timeline perspective to, to start developing that plan. Um, 
you know, what, what are obviously areas of higher priority um, compared to others. Um, trying to, again, trying to work um, really the programming needs with, with the building or, or with the other strategic plan initiatives as well. And then the final piece of that is really to identify the funding for this. So we do know that we have some capital funds available. Um, again, last December we um, presented the board our, our 50 for 50 plan, um, dedicating um, at least $50 million of capital uh, four to five years. But again, this, this is planned for a 10-year time horizon, so we will have to, to look at what other funding is to address, to address the plan and implement the plan. And then we do expect to be um, back here 11 months from now, approximately in September 2023, to really um, present that plan formally to the board, um, hopefully adopt that plan, and then um, sort of begin working towards, towards the goals that are going to be out, outlined. Um, so I think I've, I've mentioned already, and, and again, similar to, to some of the technology discussion earlier, um, you know, we really look at, at this as a, as a plan with, with three or four different lenses and really trying to integrate the programming, the teaching, and the learning aspect of this with, with a holistic view of our facilities. So when we go back and look at um, our prior facility plan in 2014 and maybe how our building operations department has functioned in the past, it's really been a heavy focus on infrastructure. Um, so we're looking to expand that view um, to, to include the programming and learning piece, um, also to, to better integrate safety and security. Um, we have done safety and security audits in the past, with the most recent one being in 2015, but trying to take, an, uh, trying to take advantage of, of integrating that further with, with a master facility plan, um, more directly with the infrastructure and the programming piece. And then finally, putting an emphasis on st sustainability as well. So. Um, Again, we show these as, as four separate lenses, all with, with sort of their own unique characteristics, but we believe there's going to be heavy overlap as well as we look in these four areas. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll just briefly walk through, this, again, sort of those four focus areas, um, the first being that, that traditional sort of building infrastructure look. Um, again, I, I, without, without going through all the areas, you know, the general guiding questions when we talk about building infrastructure is ensuring that the building's physically safe and secure, that our facility complies with all building codes, and that we're providing a comfortable learning environment. Um, the areas of focus range from looking at the roofing and exterior um, brickwork um, down into to things like flooring, paint, aesthetics, ceilings, um, looking at our landscaping, our playgrounds, and our athletic fields um, as well. Um, again, an area that maybe we've overlooked in the past has been aesthetics. Um, this, many of our facilities are well past due for aesthetic improvements. So again, that's, that's flooring, that's painting, that's um, lighting and, and, and ceiling tiles. So uh, we know that's going to be a focus and we know that's going to be, be an important part where we're, we're sort of due for, for an upgrade with the district um, um, district wide. I think traditionally we've thought of aesthetics as, as kind of just um, uh, maybe a nice to have or a luxury when we talk about our school buildings, but um, you know when we, it, but that's really a, a narrow view or a building operations view. When we talk with our teachers and we talk with our students, we know that that, that builds the learning environment and that builds, um, you know, that builds on their ability to focus, their ability to to learn, that the ability for that room to function as the teacher envisions it. So we do want to want to maybe bring bring a higher em emphasis to those areas than we have in the past. So moving on, the second area would be programming and learning. So again, these are these are some questions. These are some areas that maybe our our um, department hasn't looked at in the it, as thoroughly in the past. Um, we've relied more directly on our our teaching and learning teams, our our building administrations to um, to focus on these areas. But again, we're trying to really bring that synergy back um, as part of this master plan. So um, looking at how our buildings um, supporting current learning modalities. Um, trying to trying to work directly with our technology team, and again, Rod, Rod hit on this earlier, but making sure that our buildings and our facilities can support our current technology, um, as well as our future technology needs. Um, making sure that we have sufficient um, space for interventions, specialized programming, um, whether that's um, students working one on one with a staff member or students working in small groups, and then finally, we we don't want to overlook our extracurricular programming as well. So while um, you know, our, again, our, our teams maybe had a traditional focus on, on sort of the core classroom or the school day. Um, we know, especially um, over the last year, um, hearing from our community, 
hearing about um, some of the mental health challenges, we, how important those extracurricular programs athletic fields, our aquatic centers, our You know, I, I just think of um, 1997 is kind of the bellwether year for me when I think of our facilities. That's the year we opened, um, I think, six or seven new buildings. So those buildings are 25 years old now. And when we think about how much has changed in education over the past 25 years, that really will help drive the, the conversation of how, how potentially out of date some of our buildings are. Um, and, and how much we, we really need a, a refresh or an update to make sure they're supporting learning. Giant tube TV in every classroom. Um, I don't think those TVs have been turned on in 15 years. Um, uh, unfortunately, I have to report some of them are still there. Uh, we probably have students who don't know they're a TV. Um, <laughs> but that's but that was sort of the the hot technology 25 years ago. So a lot of our buildings were built um, pre Wi-Fi, um, pre one to one devices. So uh, you know really needing to to look at our our buildings and make sure that we're um, we're in a position where we can best support our technology. Um, again, a lot of focus on the core classroom 25 years ago, but not as much focus on the need for um, intervention spaces for spaces that again can be used for one-on-one -on -one interventions with, with a teacher, a teacher working in a small group, or students working together in a, in a collaborative environment. Um, and finally, we know as a district we've seen an increase in our um, special, um, special or uh, diverse populations, um, seen an increase in students with IEPs, um, students coming with ELL needs. Um, so making sure we're, we have facilities that could support those students as well. Um, overall, I, I just think of our facilities, you, you know, you kind of have three choices. Our, our facilities can, um, enhance our student learning, they can sort of be neutral, or they can hinder our student learning. And I think we're really trying to, to take a step to make sure we're, we're developing facilities and we're putting a plan in place where our facilities will enhance our student learning as opposed to um, sort, of, sort of, you know, being a neutral, um, neutral environment or an environment that, that's, that's just there that um, relies on, on the teacher, the programming to really elevate the, the educational experience. Um, third, we will, we will be doing um, a full review of our safety and security pra um, um, practices. So this includes both the building structures, but also, also we'll probably get into some of our um, practices and policies as well. Um, again, we last did a safety and security audit in 2015, so we are about due to, to do a refresh look on this. Um, I will point out we've done a lot of work in this area over the last um, couple years. We've done um, significant work on, on um, Door, doors and locks, um, new intercom systems at, at substantially all of our buildings. Uh, so th there may be some areas where we've done a lot of the, the building work, but now we need to focus on training and implementation of best practices. Um, but, but other things we want to look at is, is, is really sort of the third guiding question. How do we make sure our buildings are secure while also providing the welcoming environment we want for our visitors, um, for our staff, and, and ultimately for our students on a daily basis? So. Um, we want to work through what the, the best practices are, whether it is, um, uh, whether it's a building focus, whether it's a, a practice or, or policy focus, to make sure we can achieve that, that balance. Um, again, our buildings, um, you know, I, I believe we have strong practices now. I believe our buildings are safe and secure places for learning, but we want to continue to improve on that and focus on that. And then the final lens is the lens of sustainability. And really what we mean about this is a building that, um, that is going to be able to support our district, um, both our current needs and our needs in the future. So that's looking at making sure the building, again, ties into that enrollment and, and boundary work we've already done in the past year. Um, making sure that the, the building is going to work for the community needs as well. So um, we know that our buildings are not just assets for the school system, but they're assets for the overall community. Um, we do over a million dollars of building rentals each year. Um, we do have several intergovernmental agreements with our park districts. So it, as part of this, we want to drive just discussion about some of those broader uses as well. Um, we want to make sure our buildings have systems that are operating efficiently. Um, we do believe as we start doing this work, we can look at it with a lot of aspects of this uh, towards a return on investment. So investing capital dollars that should create long-term savings on the operating side. And then finally, looking at um, 
looking at it with the lens of making sure what we're doing is something we're going to be able to sustain. So um, improving systems in a way where we know they're going to have predictable and affordable maintenance and operating costs going forward. I'll, and I guess the, the only other, the, the one specific thing, again, I didn't want to cover everything we have on these slides, but, but lighting and flooring when John gets into the, the <coughs> summer of 2023 projects, that's going to start being a pro priority right away for us because we do know that that's an area where um, we think there's some significant um, positive ROI, positive operating savings that we can generate right away. Um, and so that's, just, that's one of the reasons, again, when we talk about priority in the work in, the phase, in that phase two, um, we can really use that ROI component to, to start prioritizing work. Um, so that's sort of the transition to when we start talking about our summer 2023 projects. Um, so for summer 2023, we will not have the completed master facility project done, but I think we've identified a lot of the um, low-hanging fruit, so to speak, that would, be, that would be a high priority item on that plan. So that's primarily deferred maintenance needs um, throughout the district. Um, major categories for work is going to include those nine elementary playground replacements that Marie's going to talk about shortly. Um, paving, roofing work, flooring, um, some HVAC work, and then some athletic field work as well. Um, we're here tonight, traditionally we've, we've done this presentation towards, um, towards December or, or time in the winter, but we do recognize the need for some accelerated timeline for bids and contracts. Um, again, as uh, John mentioned earlier, we did see some challenges in the, in the current labor and supply market, so um, you know, we're trying to move that timeline earlier to, to create as much, um, much time as possible. Um, and also to create plan B or contingencies. So if some of the work we have planned tonight um, you know, we go out to bid and we find out that we're, we're just not able to, to get the work done at, at, at what's a reasonable price or what we've budgeted, that gives us an opportunity to pivot and, and um, come back to the board with, with an alternative work plan in, in a specific area. So with that, um, before I turn it over to Maria, I just, just want to talk um, briefly um, about this playground renovation project. Um, the reason we want to spend a little bit of time on it tonight is really two reasons. I mean, the, the first, obviously, it's a, it's a, um, a plan we're really excited about. Um, you know, it, again, we get to talk about something that our students are going to get to see and engage with on a daily basis, um, in, in all, eventually in all um, of our elementary schools. Um, but we also think it's going to really show what we have planned going forward when we talk about the master facility plan. So. Um, uh, Maria's going to talk, I think, a lot about our, our plan for getting the community involved in this specific project, and that should serve as an example for how we, how we plan to do our rest of our facility work as well. Um, the second thing is, is the, the community aspect of this. So we were able to obtain a grant for a large portion of this work, and that was through Representative Yang Rohr's office, uh, our state representative for, for these nine, nine schools. Um, and so again, by, by focusing on a project that has a lot of community engagement, that has a, a benefit to not just the school system but the community, we're able to, to achieve that synergy and, and ultimately receive a, a grant that's going to offset a significant portion of the cost. So again, when we look at, at, a, at a template for how we're going to try and do things going forward, um, that's an important part of it. Um, so with that, I, I will turn it over to Maria again to talk specifically about our playgrounds. All right, thank you, Matt. And um, thank you, board, for allowing me to come today to talk a little bit more about the fun stuff on playground, these playground replacements at um, these nine elementary schools. Just as a recap, the nine schools that we are um, planning on replacing this year, or um, planning this year, but replacing uh, next summer, is uh, Mary Lou Collishaw, Springbrook, Brookdale, Owen, Longwood, May Watts, Kendall, Clow, and Patterson Elementary Schools. Um, we are kind of in the, the middle of this, this process, um, but I wanted to hit on a few different things tonight, um, both the school participation and their involvement in customizing their new playground environments, um, the community engagement to make sure that we have input from just not um, a staff elementary level, but the larger community as well, um, and just an overall project timeline of how we plan on getting this done. So this first piece, um, the uh, school involvement. Um, we were fortunate enough to meet every school last week, actually. <laughs> um, it was a tour of all different, all the different uh, existing playgrounds. And what we were really tasked the, each school to do is come up with a stakeholder, 
stakeholder group. Um, that stakeholder group involved um, people of their choosing. So we spoke to principals, teachers, nurses had um, some excellent input, <laughs> as well as uh, monitors um, during recess. And we also had a few students participate as well, which was a great feedback session. Um, so during this kickoff meeting, we evaluated on site in the cold um, the existing playground equipment. For as old as, as it is, I do give um, uh, props to you guys for uh, maintaining the condition that it is for the heavy use and love that it gets. <laughs> but um, it is way past its useful life, and this is where we're at today in replacing that. Um, so we did have that discussion on what needs to be replaced and what doesn't need to be replaced. Um, and then we kind of got their feedback of what kind of elements they wanted to see. When all the playgrounds were built um, years back, there were swings, a two to five play structure, and a five to 12 age play structure. And um, some of those schools did have some um, accessory climbing pieces as well. Uh, what we offered each school is to kind of customize that approach and we talk through those. Um, so that kickoff meeting went really well and those site visits went really well. Um, the next step is to go to this community engagement process, that focus group. We did talk about the surve online survey that were um, being published this week. Um, so we will get larger feedback from the community and that's down to the specific. What slide do you actually want to see in your playground? What kind of swings do you want to see? What's your favorite climber? So we'll get all this feedback from the community at large. Um, and then we received all the feedback last week from our focus groups. And then that will um, kind of allow us to further in the design and come up with options. Um, once we go through those options, we'll meet in about a month with school, the school focus groups again review all the different co uh, concepts for the playground equipment itself, and then um, we'll finalize those plans for um, construction documents. So here in front of you is a schedule of what that might look like. Um, uh, moving forward in future years, we plan to adhere to this plan. Um, during August, we were able to do base file preparation, so that's topographic surveys of the site, understanding accessi accessible routes to our playgrounds from the main entry doors. Um, making sure that they are accessible. So that was completed. Um, our project kicked off, kickoff wasn't in September, but next year it will be. Um, but we, <laughs> we were able to have them in October as well as our online survey. So what the schedule does is allow a little bit of flexibility in making sure that we're still hitting our major milestones. Um, in November, again, like I'd mentioned, we're gonna go back and review our concepts. And then that will prepare us for finalizing all the plans and the actual equipment, and prepare our construction documents for bidders to bid on. Um, so in January is construction documents, and then at the next slide, we could see that um, by March, we are ordering the equipment, going out to bid, making sure that we have everything in place so that we could begin construction as, school, as soon as school lets out in June, um, and complete that construction in August. Part of this project also, um, while we have our focus group's attention, is to prepare an overall play plan. And what that means is generally an outdoor master plan for each site, um, considering uh, what Matt had mentioned, the intergovernmental uh, agreements with the park district, um, understanding what needs and use of the outdoor facilities they have, and then incorporating other things, such as outdoor classrooms or amphitheaters or um, loop paths or other boundary markers um, that would help teachers and caretakers um, during school. So part of this process is all to also to make sure that we have a plan moving forward as funds come available to make that happen. Thank you. So yes, playgrounds are an integral part of our 2023 uh, summer work. Uh, I want to touch on some other projects that we'll be embarking on. Um, we will be doing a lot of paving and concrete work. We're looking at 13 locations right now, five locations for roughing work. Um, I'm gonna begin starting the, the carpet replacement at all the elementary schools this summer, and the plan is in four years, they're all replaced. Uh, Matt had mentioned earlier about the sustainability of, of uh, projects like flooring, and it, it, sometimes it's hard to see, but 
the flooring changes that have occurred over the last few years are pretty amazing. You can put a floor in now that doesn't require any stripping and waxing or uh, stripping and coating of wax. Um, you don't need to worry about shampooing the carpet. It's very, it's very green. It's very tough. And uh, imagine what we can do with the 100 custodians in summer not having to strip and wax floors and move furniture all summer. We can actually have them do some really neat things. So um, we're starting on that project uh, this summer. Um, HVAC, we've already uh, got a, a RFP out on the street, so hopefully we'll be bringing that to you guys soon. And then, of course, we talked about the playgrounds. Um, and like Rod had mentioned in his presentation, our, uh, our strategy plan really highlights all four of the priorities from our strategic plan, and I just wanted to, uh, I, just, I just listed them here, but um, you know, I truly believe that providing a, a safe, comfortable, clean learning and teaching environment is really good to the success of students and staff. Um, next steps, just real quick, we will, um, we will put many bids out in the next uh, days and weeks and coming back for approval in the next couple months. Um, the master facility plan proposal will be going out uh, in October and we expect to have that to you by December. And the uh, completed master facility plan, like Matt said, will be done in 11 months. So with that, uh, we'll take any questions. Mr. Krubus. I'm, I'm really excited that uh, we're moving down the path for this. Uh, I love a lot of what we're hearing. Um, the completion of elementary air conditioning. Uh, that's, that's very exciting. Uh, some, some things I want to point out. Um, slide nine, the collaborative process. You mentioned the communication aspect on uh, the playground. Um, and so the, the communication piece is one of the important parts, people might not want to collaborate with you, they might not engage, but just extending the invitation is huge. Um, and so I'd be interested to, to learn how we plan on reaching out to the community at large. Um, we ran into some challenges uh, when we were going through the boundary process with reaching out to the community that I think we can learn and apply to this as well. Uh, so there's uh, there's some there's some learning there, but communicate, collaborate, those are huge. If we're going to pull this off successfully, um, the community needs to be involved. Uh, and part of that collaboration is really deciding to do things like the playground. Um, you know, obviously the playground was a unique project. It, things were lining up to get that done. But the communication and collaboration will decide that we need to do, we want to do the playground first instead of doing, you know, the, the library or doing some other area. So um, we, we want to make sure that that stuff happens even earlier. Obviously this was a great area with the grant funding and, and whatnot to get done now um, but uh, let's make sure that when we're developing this the, the communication collaboration is involved in the pri prioritization as well let's, let's let's pick this plan to do first um, and then there was you you dabbled with it a little bit but part of this really is a staffing assessment as, as well um, and I know you're filling big shoes taking DePaul's role, um, but part of what I'm hearing as a proposal, it might take, you know, three Todd DePaul's to get this done kind of assessment where if we are looking at the instructional changes in how we provide instruction, well, we might need more staff to do that. We might need it more um, aides to, uh, to monitor that. We might need less custodians to, 
to, you know, care for the 30 year old carpet. Um, or we might need more administrators to, to just manage the bidding process. So it's, it's not a facility assessment without taking into consideration the staffing part as well. And then I know I've talked about this in other areas, but I, I, I want to just do it here now is uh, part of the equity aspect of it. Um, you know, through the air conditioning, we've tried to mitigate um, some of the equitable issues amongst the elementary school buildings. We had some buildings that had AC and some that didn't. And so we went through the AC work to try to make sure that all of the buildings had AC. Um, take that to the other extreme, you know, well, Bonzi has a planetarium. Not every building needs a planetarium. So it doesn't have to be completely equal. Um, but my example would be, you know, the athletic, the artificial turf at Matea. Um, it's re reaching its natural life, needs to get replaced. Well, the other facilities don't have that turf. What are we going to do about that? And I don't have an answer here. I'm not asking for an answer, but that's one area where you want to look at it through the equity lens. And if you give a community the ability to choose the playground equipment, well, you want to make sure that you know at least they have swings because that's part of the menu, and they don't just all choose one aspect of it that kind of excludes the other. So I. I think it's important that as we go through this, um, there's there's that check, and whether you know we provide a menu or we think through some of that, the the equity aspect is important as well. Um, that's all I got. Great work, guys. Thanks. Ms. Fosdick. There's a lot in here, and it seems mostly like exciting stuff, so that's good. Um, I really appreciate the renewed attention to aesthetics that Mr. Shipley mentioned, um, because I think I really believe our surroundings matter, and given the increasing amount of time our staff and our students are spending in these spaces, uh, I think it is important. Right? It obviously isn't, we gotta get the roof first as a floor, <laughs> but beyond that, I appreciate that we're still touching on that aesthetics piece. Um, and as a former Springbrook parent, I'm so excited about the playgrounds <laughs> <laughs> for those kids in those communities. Um, and I love that, you know, I had parents in my community asking me, you know, are we going to be able to weigh in? Are we going to be able to know about it? So I'm really thrilled to hear that you are asking for community input on that. Um, like board member Karuba said, I'm sure there is some way to do a check and balance so that X school doesn't end up with the Disneyland of playgrounds and <laughs> another school doesn't. You know, I'm sure that's all allotted out. Um, but that ability to play and for parents to feel good about where their kids are playing, that it's safe, that it's secure, that it's updated, that it's fun, um, and for kids to really enjoy it is so important, especially with that time to get outside and move. Um, so I'm really, really excited that we're able to do that now. So thank you for the work on that. Ms. Grover. Thank you for this. This is elaborate. Um, I really like the slides 11 to um, 15 because you lay out the questions and how it's all like the sustainability, um, the infrastructure. My, my question is on slide 13, which is program and learning. So do you anticipate, I'm not sure how you're gonna do this, you go to each building and, and study their um, structure from the inside and program and learning and see what they need and what they don't need. Is that the plan? It, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, I, it, it, we will be working very closely with each, we, we know each of our buildings and, and again, that having the strategic plan in place, having the, en the enrollment and, and uh, capacity piece understood I mean we, we know um, 
we know each building may have some some unique needs um, but so so there's a piece that it that and again consistent with some of the other um, conversations about equity I mean that there are pieces that are going to be um, consistent throughout all our buildings but then we'll be looking at the unique um, situation the unique student populations of each building to, to really make sure that we're developing a facility that that serves those student needs and I'll um, the, the one example I'll, I'll give um, that, that was a I think it ties in well with with again the enrollment and, and uh, boundary work we did is we made a commitment as part of that work to identify which buildings would have self-contained programming over the next um, over the next seven to ten years so historically our, our approach to self-contained programming had sort of been find where we had room and in cases where we didn't have room sometimes you know find <laughs> um, tell schools that they were hosting those programs anyway but um, you know really find space that wasn't designed for that programming but was available um, so as, as part of the boundary work we made sure that we carved out some space for those programmings on the front end and now we're at a position when we do the facility study to know that those buildings are going to have that programming for the foreseeable future. So instead of taking three to five traditional classrooms and just labeling them self-contained classrooms, we can really think through what should that classroom look like knowing that that's serving um, our, our higher needs populations. Um, and that may mean that the core classroom can be smaller because we know that there's less students in there. So now um, we can repurpose a portion of the room for some of that breakout space we've talked about. Um, it, you know, we know that those rooms need, um, um, when you walk through those buildings, a lot of times you see items stored in the hallway because those, those students um, can't deal with the distraction of, of having a shelf of things. So do we make additional room for storage in, in those buildings? So um, again, an area where we would work very closely with those specific buildings, with our um, student services team to really think through what if we had the opportunity which we now do to design a self-contained classroom or a self-contained ring of a building from the ground up what should that look like as opposed to just saying okay here's here's the four classrooms for self-contained right and I think that was one of the things that came out in redistricting too was the innovative spaces and maybe creating collaborative spaces and I know some high schoolers don't use all their lockers, so there's wasted space there sometimes. Um, I have a question on safety and security. What is the protocol, if you could speak to when a, p a parent or somebody enters a building, everybody has to push in the buzzer because I know some parents are, um, they're, they worry about the safety about entering. So all our schools is that you have to push in the buzzer and you have to show identity before you can enter? Uh, th that, that's correct. Um, and we use a system which, which um, a lot of school districts use. It's called Raptor. So that, that identification actually goes through a scan, um, which generates your visitor's pass. Um, that scan does check, um, does a mini background check, if you will, to, to ensure that that, that individual is um, somebody who should be in our buildings. Uh, where where we see some challenges, and again we've we've worked through them, um, but but a majority of our buildings were were built prior to um, um, I can't think of a better way to say this, but prior to some of the national um, tragedies we've seen, Columbine being the one that really was the the sort of game changer when it came to to building design and really thinking through these as a um, incidents as a possibility. So. Um, so some of our buildings aren't set up in a way that makes that an ideal flow. Um, so, so can we, um, whether it's modifying the main entrance to, to add a, an additional vestibule or, or some additional design piece that can make that um, sort of it an even easier or more intuitive part of the process of entering the building as opposed to what it is now, which is kind of a, um, you know, clunky and convenient process. Make it still have it provide the same high level of, of security but do it in a, in a more streamlined and and uh, welcoming fashion um, again because we don't want people when they enter our schools to feel like they're they're entering a courtroom or an airport or anything like that so how do we provide that that similar level of, of security but do it in a in a more welcoming fashion and my third thing is to the playgrounds excited about the playgrounds especially because even middle schoolers come back to use the playgrounds so 
that's great, and I'm I'm happy about the collaboration with that. Miss Jane. Thank you for today's presentation. Um, I want to speak to the same slides that Board Member Grover spoke to uh, with, go with regard to the guiding questions. I, I really um, like that we're in a place that we're asking these questions. I know that that's um, unique, and I think uh, going off of what Board Member Krubus stated, I think that communication piece and contextualizing how we got to this point um, and being clear about that message with our community is really important so we can appreciate where we are. I think for me, the where I need a little bit more clarification, and this will probably come in the coming months, is understanding what our wish list is versus what we can actually implement and deliver and what that process is of prioritizing and selecting uh, what that, um, what is, what we're able to meet off of that list. I think that that to me is uh, a communication piece that I would like to see in terms of reconciling this vision and hope of what we want our district to be with also the budget, the limited budget that we have, right? And understanding that, knowing that you guys are thinking about that, but just communicating that. Yeah. Uh yeah, I could I could speak to that quickly. So so yes, and that's why the the process really is sort of the, the two steps. So when we talk about that initial assessment, it is building the wish list, and we expect um, uh, you know we'll be doing it right after Christmas. So I'm, I'm we'll have some good experience at uh, our students, especially <laughs> at building their Christmas list, and we can kind of build on that. Um, it, yeah, we're we're looking for those to be all all encompassing and and really really outline a, a vision. Um, a, a true vision for for Indian Prairie to to, to continue to be a leader, um, the, a leading school district in, in both the state and the country. Um, the the second part, when we get to actually building the assessment, is when we start um, trying to to match that with reality a little bit and start looking at at what that that means from a funding standpoint. And uh, again, what what prior what project should be prioritized, um, and what maybe needs to to, to wait or, or continue to be deferred a little bit um, and and with the final category maybe being some things that we that we can't get done absent some grant funding or some other opportunities but uh, yeah that that that'll be part of the process and and um, again I think we I think we intentionally want it to be two phases because we don't want to leave anything out for the initial list um, for budgetary concerns we want to make sure that we are getting we want to make sure we're getting the feedback from our community that um, doesn't have that that restriction on the front end, um, but but then we'll we'll kind of match that up at, at on the on the back half of the process. Yes, thank you. I love that in our brainstorming phase where we're not putting any restrictions. I think that's great. Uh, my last question is with regard to the playgrounds. How did we go about selecting these nine elementary schools? Are all schools getting this eventually? Is it limited to these nine schools? Yeah, uh, the, the nine schools that are specifically selected are, are because they're um, a requirement of the grant. But so the, um, again, I'll, I'll recognize that, it, that this, this project's being partially funded by, um, through our state representative, Janet Yang Rohr. Um, so those are the, the nine, nine that were selected with this phase. Um, we do plan over the next um, two to three summers to get to all of them, and, and again, I think Maria can talk through. Um, I think already did talk to that. That hopefully this this process is a successful one, and we'll follow a similar process for the remaining remaining buildings. Okay, thank you, Miss Dumming. Thank you for the presentation. It was excellent and so informative. Um, Board member Jane just answered, asked one of the questions that I did about prioritization. So um, thank you on that. Didn't you mentioned you think it'll be um, two to three years before we'll be able to look at the rest of the elementary schools or so? From a, as far as will we look to seek yeah. other grants or something to? Yeah, we're 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 hoping to we're hoping to get the nine completed this summer, and then um, the next twelve would be either summer twenty twenty four or some combination of twenty four and twenty five. 
perfect. Um, I had looked at, um, let's see, it was slide um, 11 or 12 and 13, and, and just um, as board member Fostick um, mentioned, the attention to aesthetics and having all the conversations that we've had about facilities over the time that that I've you know been on the board we've never gotten to that we've, we've talked about safety security we've talked about um, you know the ones that we've got to make sure that we get to before we see um, you know anything serious happen but it's so important and it really can change the outlook and the attitude for students as well as um, the staff coming in and being sure that they're engaged, that they're excited to be there, that makes such a big difference. So um, I know that it's something that, uh, that our district will take great pride in, in seeing our buildings now, being able to have that, uh, that focus as well as, as making sure that they're, um, that they're secure. So thank you for that. Um, that's really all I wanted to say. I really appreciate um, the presentation and really excited to see the changes on our playgrounds. So thank you. Mr. Rising. Um, if you go to slide 11. So I love this approach. Um, Myself and Mr. Krubus were around in the last facility study, um, and uh, the two of us can also attest to um, we have not nearly spent enough in our facilities as we should have the last few years. Um, to no fault of the board or the district, um, because 80% of our funding and revenue goes towards salaries. Um, so we had to, you know, the reason we went out for that facility study was to see where our priority areas had to be. Um, I'm very encouraged that we are up to spending $10 million because I think back in 2000, well, I, was, I know in 2018, we were only spending about $4 million per year. Um, I also recall that was the year that we did the Engage 204, which I think a lot of us were here for. Um, we have effectively checked off all the things on Engage 204, and many of those were facility things, um, including the air conditioning, the locks we put on the classroom doors, the intercoms, various other things. Um, if you could go to slide um, 13, Programming learning, um, I, I know um, Ms. Grover and, and Ms. Jane touched on this. Um, I think maybe a couple other board members. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the focus that we have on the areas of programming and learning because we did make some of those commitments to our community during the boundary changes. Um, that we would look at some of those classrooms, and you touched on that too, Mr. Shipley, as far as self-contained and or STEM rooms or things, other areas, and uh, is that something we're gonna continue to look at? Yeah, absolutely, yes. Okay. Um. Um, and then the next slide, slide 14. Um, I mentioned the Engage 204, and, and one of the priority recommendations were locks the, the new locks on all the doors and, and the and the intercoms. There was additional safety recommendations, um, and as I recall, during that presentation in 2018, a lot of that was um, around the perimeters of our buildings, um, that being exterior doors, um, as well as cameras. Now, I know we've got locks on all exterior doors. Um, I know we have cameras at the high school, but I would make an argument, and I know this is gonna be a focus of the facility study, but I would make an argument that if we have money in our capital funds, that we I prioritize that to security 
now more than ever. Um, having listened to Ron speak at schools, you know, he tries to instruct teachers at, you know, schools to go around and check exterior doors. But I think there's more that we can do as a district to make sure that those are locked. Um, and I would, would also like to keep a focus on that. Um, I know a lot of that may not come until the facility study is released, but if there's extra, I would like us to place that focus on safety and security. Um, and then um, you said the nine elementary schools that were chosen were a condition of the grant. Um, the additional six Naperville, five Aurora, and one Bolingbrook Elementary schools, you said their playgrounds will be looked at? W w yes. And we'll if need be, there will be changes hopefully by 2024 or so, ish. They'll all be uh, renewed. Okay. They, they are all past their useful life. We, oh, they we are. can okay. say that with certainty. Um, the reason why we hired Lori and her, and her firm is that we were calling this like the playground playbook, so we have a methodology of, of, of mimicking this for the other 12, so it makes it easier. It'll, it'll be a lot of consistency um, throughout all 21 schools. Okay, all right. I'm not using it for the LMCs, for STEM labs. I mean, it's just a good way of building some consistency throughout the district. Okay. Equity. Yeah, I did have too many questions. I just wanted to say that I'm very concerned about security, and I know our community is as well. So. Thanks. So thank you very much. Um, I know um, we spent 10, what, 10 and a half million this past summer, but we went many years with not spending the recommended amount, so we still have a major backlog of projects. Is that correct? That's correct. <laughs> and um, so it's like, you know, I'm glad that we were able to work on all of this but we still have uh, many things that we put aside in the past that weren't um security or you know the top priority like more like roofs and um cracks and walls i remember some school that had the wall separating from the gym or whatever so yeah um you know critical things that we had to fix but we still put aside a, a lot of things that are still out there um waiting to be addressed and that will be important to continue to look at that in our wish list of um, items. And for years, I have always been reluctant when we did the um, presentations about the facilities to bring up aesthetics because I thought we have so many other critical needs that this, I can't, it looks silly to bring that up, right? But I do agree with the, a number of people have raised the, how important it is and I, I reflect even on the outside of the building. <clears throat> if you compare it to like downtown Naperville, they could not plant beautiful flowers and all of the little berms and things and just have dirt sitting there. And Naperville would look a lot less attractive walking around in the summer and people wouldn't wanna shop there and go eat at restaurants and things or eat their ice cream cone or whatever. I feel the same way with our schools. It's like you need to make sure they're a welcoming environment. We have a lot of families that move in and come and tour the building. So it's not just the carpet and the paint and, you know, it looks nice, but the outside too. So um, I hope that we'll be able to find room to look at that also going forward. Um, yeah, we, and we do have landscaping specifically. Yeah, I saw that on one of the yeah, slide 14, I think. And, and we do think... Um, Again, trying to trying to look at it with it with a holistic um, lens, we do think that um, these are areas where partially because we've deferred it for so long, um, but these these are areas where there are some significant um, cost savings on the operational side. So, um, prioritizing um, again um, LVT style flooring as opposed to carpeting um, can greatly reduce our maintenance on that flooring cost. Um, the, um, John, I don't know if you want to talk about LED lighting and what we think we'll save if, as we do some lighting improvements there. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be a million dollars a year in energy. Be See, that's beautiful. It's like we get upgrades and we save money at the same time. So it's wonderful hearing that. Um, I agree that having looking at the learning environment is very important and security also. I mean, the 
things that you touched in the presentation were spot on for me. And um, I also am thrilled about the playgrounds because my kids went to Springbrook and um, we had a spout of about two weeks when three kids, right, my daughter and the kid two doors down and one across the street broke their arm on the monkey bar. So uh, I think if we can look at uh, improving the safety and you know what the kids can climb and play on, that's going to be um, a great thing. So thank you very much. It was very informative. All right, uh, legislative advocacy and Board of Education update. Anyone have any items? We are having um, a LEND meeting, I believe, this week on Friday. And also there's a large um, district meeting on Wednesday for the IASB that I'll go to. And then now we have our IASB resolutions and position statements, and there were a number of um, amendments to the uh, Constitution for IASB, also new resolutions and position statements that we need to discuss, and then at our next meeting, we'll vote on um, how we will um, how we will fall on those items. But Ms. Grover, do you want to talk through that? I sure. So what's interesting, first of all, is in 2021, um, there were 23 submitted and 16 approved. I think um, it's going to be a short meeting at the Delegate Assembly because only eight were approved this time, which is like half of it. Um, so ours, nobody said that they wanted to discuss anything. So I think we're just going to, um, does any, nobody said that they, so I guess that's good. <laughs> we're, yeah, we're just going to agree with, um, we, I was just going to bring up R2. Um, Actually, I do have a question before you get to oh, R2. Okay, sure. Uh, is it your understanding on number four and five, one had to do with capital grant funding and one had to do with school safety funding? Um, I don't expect you to know this like off the top of your head, but in my perception and reading through both of these, they were looking at prioritizing how those funds were distributed in the same manner as evidence-based funding is distributed. Was that your perception of those two? Uh, and it, you can always get back to me. And I don't know if anybody else. I saw it as that they would just kind of like, remember last year how they had the, the funding for the cars, or not cars, it was funding for the environment, some environmental electric, yeah, there was some kind of federal funding that they wanted for different items. And so that's what I see it as. It's asking for federal funding. Um, or not federal, state funding for that. But that's how I see it. I don't see it as related to the evidence-based funding. Okay. The, the, the way I read both of them was state funding, additional state funding, and state funding that's awarded based on, right. you know, the same way they fund evidence-based funding, which to me is sounds very, and you could it sounds it, very, very yeah, selfish. Yeah, because they added that language, uh, the one that's underlined about the criteria, which is like the evidence-based funding stuff. Yeah, which I, but I, I just, yeah. in general, they, they've been receiving a lion's share of the additional funding that's been going on, and I just have a problem in general with that, but okay, all right. Go ahead, carry on. So. One piece of that four piece criteria. So I didn't read it as that was heavily decided by that, but that could certainly be just not a full understanding of it. Yeah, okay. So the number six, which was ours, which they said do not adopt. Um, like I said, we were just changing the language from them supporting a candidate to supporting a position. Uh, I really don't understand their analysis <laughs> because it, there is a lack of analysis. <laughs> um, but I'm okay 
what what are people's views on appealing this or just let it be or So it would be appeal to have the delegate assembly. Then if we appeal what the procedure would be, then we go in front and they will ask the delegate assembly, hey, do you guys want to hear this? And then they vote on whether no. they can say two thirds yeah. majority vote. And they vote. have to have two, two thirds, thirds of two the thirds. people okay. say yes. So I mean, there, there's a significant yeah. hurdle to get over. So, yeah. so sometimes people say, and, it, and you, it's, you can just, people just vote. So it's not like there's an extra layer that you have to jump through. It's just saying, hey, I want to appeal basically. And then you go and say why you, you kind of go in there and say what you're representing and why you th think this is important. And then they decide whether they agree that they should hear it or they shouldn't even hear it like you know I just think no matter where you sit I mean I, I clearly support it so from my point of view no matter where you sit this is a benefit this is not a negative um, so I think it's worth <coughs> taking the risk the worst they can say is no and then we're back here mm -hmm. but I don't know what that what that requires of Mark, for example, because since he'll be there <laughs> representing our, our district, so. Um, so you know, it's interesting because when, when Natasha and I presented in front of the resolution committee, uh, I actually thought the changing in this was a slam dunk. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, the only thing <laughs> based on their lack of uh, analysis is that they thought that our changing in the language was ba basically equal to what currently exists and really just semantics. You know, that, that's the only thing that I can figure out because they really didn't give us much to go on. And they, it's almost like they just felt what was there was good enough linguist I would say semantics matter well yeah and that's what we were essentially trying right. to cl clean up right. but, but a logistical question if we don't appeal does that prohibit us from making this amendment again right like this is closed right this is done yeah. after after this round since it was it's denied this time, we couldn't yeah. bring it up. So this would be our last chance this anyways. It, from that perspective, can, can, can yeah. we, though? You can bring yeah, it up next year? Yeah, we can clean it up. Year? We can clean it up yeah. and bring it back next year. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, because you, but not again this year, yeah. Time. It's like, I don't know if you remember the gun one that kept on coming up. So you can keep on bringing <laughs> it up. But this year, they it seemed like they made a they made an, a, an effort not not to not to allow one. those. I yeah, did see that. Yeah. They said that if it had already been um, denied by a certain percentage, then they weren't going to uh, entertain or or look at that again. So I I just wanted to know what would be the possible long term for effects. So I feel that. You can bring it up, but it would be difficult for them to pass it again. The reason I'm saying this is just because it seems like they have really um, made it tight, the resolutions. I mean, going from 16 to 8, they've, yeah. they've really cut out. They really are looking for something new. I mean, and then a lot of them, they said, we don't even want to talk about adopting or do not adopting. We're just like straight, don't even want to hear it. So, which was really interesting um, because some of them, when we listened to some of them, we were like, okay, they're going to rule on this. And when they said, we're not even going to rule on this, it's kind of surprising. So, if we were to bring this again in the future, would we just need to clarify our rationale? Could be. Would that be the direction we would go? Yeah. But part of it is, you know, when you, as a parent, you sometimes, you say, what do you have to lose? <laughs> They'll just say no. I think maybe you do appeal. you do lose some political capital. Yeah. Okay. I mean, look at there's eight resolutions here that made the final round, so to speak, and we have two. And so we have one that looks like it's going to pass, and one that we got to push. And so from a 
you only have so much political capital to play with. Um, is it worth pushing it on this? I rather have the other one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think that's at risk, but yeah. you don't want to be also known as the district that, <laughs> you know, tries to bully around this assembly process. We want to be seen as a partner, and we've got a great track record with getting things done. So I mm -hmm. think we can recognize that, okay, we, we'll, we'll abide by this resolution committee, and we've, got, we've done, we've got resolutions passed, like, Absolutely. great history, <laughs> right? Uh, I would, out of 850 right. some school districts, yeah. Just about every year. I'd be willing, I, I would, I would support, um, us, because I think the hurdle of two thirds is is so such a high bar um, that one I don't know what if people will really really give it as much thought to really see what we said and will more accept what the committee recommended and since we have another one um, I almost say that we might have a better chance to bring it look look to how we might be able to. Um, change a little and bring it back next year. What's interesting in their preamble, so to speak, they talk about the two-thirds and where they usually get about 440 delegates. So when they say two-thirds and you have 800 in some districts, they're saying, look, it's such a little amount that sometimes we don't even want to advocate for it because unless everybody really is for it, it, it's a waste of resources for us to advocate for something. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and then, and then our other resolution is number eight, which they recommended do adopt. So I think we're good with that. I have nothing further, Mr. Um, Rising. Do you have anything <laughs> to uh, say? Yes. So regarding number eight. Um, some things transpired um, when we presented this to the resolution committee. Um, primarily, the resolution committee asked us if we, as a district, would want to take this further past IASB. Um, I have since investigated and looked into that. Um, I have had a separate one-on-one -on -one discussion with President Donahue and Natasha as the resolutions chair. Um, I'm gonna email all of you by tomorrow evening um, on what I have done to this point, um, what I was asked to do, um, and the conversations I had individually with President Donahue, and then if you could individually give me your individual feedback, that would be great, um, because I just wanna make sure that I know how to go forward with this. Um, I think once I understand everybody's position, I can discuss this fully at our next meeting when we talk about it, but um, because it, it's confidential in nature right now, I, I just, I, I wanna get individual feedback before I publicly discuss it. Um, does anybody have any questions around that or? I'm confused. Yeah, okay, just look for an email from yeah, me. Yeah, you'll get an email with some more info. <laughs> yeah. But, uh-uh. Here, I'll break it down, I'll give you a little. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so. I'm hearing we, uh, we, no one asked for any discussion on any specific items. Correct. Um, you got some input on the, our resolution number seven, I guess it is, the one that was do not adopt. Yeah, number six. Number six. Yeah. I guess, do we formally vote on that at Time the next meeting? Yes, okay. the next meeting. Yeah. And we will um, ask Mark to be their delegate as well at the assembly. We'll vote for that. And if you, yeah, you will have to have that as an action item too. Right, right, okay. All right, I think that's it. I need a 
Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Yes. Aye. Aye.